This is Orlando. This is where we believe in magic and fantasies and wishing upon stars and the power of the imagination. This is where we dream, where we think smarter and play harder. So if you think you know all there is to know about Orlando, you're in for a big surprise. Because until you join our community and see all the reasons we're amazing, you don't know the half of it. I go to Princeton University, majoring in psychology. I go to Harvard, and I'm majoring in economics. I'm going to Duke, and I'm majoring in psychology and global health. I'm going to Johns Hopkins, and I'm majoring in chemistry. Our advantage, great teachers and programs at Orange County Public Schools. See what's possible for you. There are magnet programs, advanced placement and honors classes, and guidance counselors who help us choose the right courses. You can even earn college credit while in high school. OCPS has programs for every type of learner. Orange County Public Schools, leading students to success. All right, if I could have everybody grab their seat. We are going to inaugurate this new boardroom by starting our first meeting in this beautiful new facility on time. Don't expect it to be a regular occurrence, but <laughs> we will do it tonight. So with that, I'm going to call this meeting in the Orange County School Board uh, to order and welcome everybody to um, to our new digs uh, here in the, uh, in the boardroom of the Orange County School Board. Uh, we had a wonderful dedication ceremony uh, earlier, and um, I just want to thank Mr. Morris again and, and Dr. Jenkins and our entire team uh, for finally bringing us into the 21st century with technology, allow us to be more open and in the sunshine and live stream our meetings and telecast our meetings with the technology that we have in this room. Uh, it's a long time coming. This boardroom had not been renovated for over 15 years, and uh, frankly, um, it showed with the wear and tear and with the technology limitations that we have. We are also now, we're very proud of this because it's very important to this board. We are now ADA compliant. We were not previously ADA compliant in this boardroom. That was one of the prime motivators for us renovating this boardroom at all, as well because it had been brought to our attention a number of times that we were not in compliance with, with, with that um, very important federal law. Um, I'd like to ask everybody to stand and bow your heads for a moment of silence, and then we will do the pledge. And as you stand and bow your heads, um, I don't know if you all heard, there was a very uh, tragic occurrence today at the Houston Independent School District. Two, two students were killed in a school bus accident. Um, so please keep those young students um, in your thoughts and prayers. and. Uh, um, I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, but somebody who's very close and near and dear to us, Mr. Woody Rodriguez, lost his mother this past week. So, Woody, uh, your mother and your family and, and you are in our thoughts and in our, in our prayers. So please join me in a moment of silence. Now the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. <clears throat> yes, please. Mrs. Robinson. I just wanted to acknowledge that we also lost um, a teacher, a faculty member at Maitland Middle School that was beloved by her community for many, many, many years. And I just want to um, mention that her name was um, Miss Debbie Dick Dickens, and um, they were they were all very sad when she passed on Friday. So I just want to pass on condolences to the family. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. All right, tonight we have an opportunity to highlight a few of our top principals and school staff in Orange County for their outstanding arts program. And as uh, many in this audience know, and hopefully folks at home know who may be watching this, uh, the arts in our schools is very, very important. We are very proud of the fact uh, that Orange County Public Schools, even throughout the depths of the recession, we have an arts program in every single one of our 189 schools and music programs as well. That is not the rule, it's more the exception in large districts uh, in America. 
and we have the taxpayers of Orange County to thank for that. Uh, frankly, that was made entirely possible during the recession because of the local option one mill that the voters just renewed uh, last uh, fall. It allowed us to maintain all of our arts and cultural programs as well as our after school programs, athletic programs, and to keep our dedicated uh, teachers and workforce provided for as they should be. Uh, we have a very important partner in our endeavors in the arts, and that is United Arts of Central Florida. And tonight we are honored to be joined by Miss, and I love saying her name as many times as I've said it, it just rolls off the tongue, Miss Flora Maria Garcia. Her parents were poets to give her a beautiful name like that. Um, Ms. Flora Maria Garcia is a president and CEO of United Arts, and they are a terrific partner of ours. Uh, they fund a great many of the trips that our students are able to take, whether it be to the Philharmonic or whether it be to the ballet or other cultural institutions that's made possible by the largesse of the donors to United Arts, the corporate community, and uh, that organization for organizing those efforts. So we appreciate that very, very much. In fact, in May, United Arts was a very big part of providing every eighth grade student something new this year, a wonderful opportunity to see a live performance on stage at the Dr. Phillips Center for the Performing Arts. And that was a tremendous experience for our students. Uh, my own kids went, and uh, for many of the children that go to that facility, that's the first time they can see a large Broadway-style experience on a professional stage. So it's a wonderful uh, initiative as well. Uh, she is going to recognize three of our outstanding principals tonight who are leaders in the fields of art education. So I'd like to welcome up to the lectern Ms. Flora Maria Garcia. Ms. Garcia, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, United Arts believes that the arts are a vital part of educating the whole child, as does OCPS, as evidenced by our 26-year partnership working together. This partnership allows 700,000 cultural experiences to our children every year. We're so pleased about that. And as Chairman Sublette mentioned, this year for the first time made possible through the generosity of Disney, it was possible for children to experience live theater in addition to going to the Philharmonic uh, and the ballet every year. A study of 2008 cohorts of Florida 12th graders sponsored by the Florida Music Educators Association showed that students with more arts education had higher academic achievements in SATs, FCAT, reading, writing, and math compared to students who take fewer arts education classes. For the general population, the more arts classes taken, the higher the student achievement and in particular for students on free and reduced lunch. The more art classes taken, the higher the level of student achievement. The more arts classes taken, the less li likely a student is to drop out of school. The Principal's Appreciation Breakfast celebrates the achievement of OCPS principals, including retaining certified arts teachers in every school and continually expanding access to arts education for all students. The 2015 breakfast saw the return of the Arts Principals Awards, which recognizes principals who lead the way in supporting and promoting arts education and arts participation in their schools. Three principals, one from each school level, were selected as the 2015 Arts Principals winners. And this, uh, these principals were selected by a panel that was chaired by Christine Moore and a number of arts educators and arts administrators from OCPS. And the, the principals were nominated by their arts teachers. Each principal received a $1,000 cash award, which is to go to art supplies, no shopping. <laughs> and uh, two, uh, two tickets to the Broadway series for each principal, so I hope they get to enjoy the arts throughout the year. In the elementary division, Principal Mary Hool with Sand Lake Elementary tripled the arts participation at Sand Lake. All students are exposed to the arts through bringing performance groups to the school. She also doubled the number of ensembles in the school and added a stomp group. Students are on a five-day rotation, and the average rotation for uh, elementary school students is 12 days. Middle school division, Jose Martinez, Lake Nona Middle School, 
Lake Nona received the Florida Music Ed Educators Association Enrollment Award for having over 60% of the student population enrolled in music. Mr. Martinez ensures that the school schedule allows students equal time in arts and core curriculum classes. I was told that I needed to say that. <laughs> Principal Martinez is also an active participant in the school's arts events, conducting concerts, providing narration, and even singing with the students. I'm sure you have a very happy school. In the high school division, Dr. Leanne Bradshaw from Oak Ridge High School Oak Ridge High's grades has risen under Bradshaw's leadership, Dr. Bradshaw's leadership. Dr. Bradshaw also sees the arts as a motivator and uses them as a way to motivate poor performing students. 40% of the students involved in visual, are involved in visual and performing arts at her school and the arts classes are balanced with remediation courses. These are the three award-winning principals. Please lend them a hand for their terrific work. That's it, thank you. Thank you so much for that recognition, Ms. Garcia. And again, thank you for your organization's leadership and support of all of our endeavors in the arts. Uh, we do have some certificates that we would like to hand out to our principals. And I just want to say on behalf of the board, uh, Ms. Poole and Mr. Martinez and Dr. Bradshaw, we are just so very, very proud of your leadership in the arts. And you truly are an inspiration for all of our principals of Orange County Public Schools and for our administration and board as well. So. Thank you very, very much, and uh, the board would love to shake your hand uh, if you would so indulge us. Okay, we do have, uh, before we jump into our main agenda, we do have some newly appointed administrators to recognize tonight, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Chairman. We have three. First, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth Fuller, who is a resource teacher at Colonial High School. She is a new assistant principal at Colonial High School. I would like to thank the board and the superintendent and the staff for this great opportunity. Also like to recognize my family and my coworkers for all of their support. Elizabeth, Elizabeth, you, you can introduce your family members if you'd like. <laughs> so in absentia. Well, who are your coworkers? Who are your coworkers? Give them a mic. This is Mr. Yeagle, Ms. Rudzik, Ms. Connolly, and Ms. Jennings, and my principal, Mr. Martinez, who is now at Colonial High School. All right, now we have Elisa Grace, resource teacher at Walker Middle, will be the new assistant principal at Walker Middle. Thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank um, Superintendent Jenkins, Dr. Jar, Ms. Schuler, Dr. Valley, Mr. Loftus, um, um, a couple that are not here, but I still want to recognize them, um, Dr. Epps, Dr. Balgaman, and Ms. Strayton for their leadership support. And I would also like to thank my father for being here and my brother for being here supporting me tonight. Aww. Oh, and Dr. Sahijan, thank you. And last, we have Jennifer Corks, instructional uh, teacher at Apopka High School, new assistant principal at Edgewater High School.
First, I'd like to thank Dr. Jenkins and her team for this wonderful opportunity. Chairman Sibillette, school board, Ms. Christine Moore, my member from the north, Ms. Robinson, who I look forward to look, working for. Um, very excited to be going to Edgewater. I'd like to thank my family and friends for being here this evening, and I'm excited to be an Edgewater Eagle. Thank you so much. So you can introduce your family, if, since they bothered to come. <laughs> we'd like to recognize them. Um, this would be my husband, my father, my son and my daughter, <laughs> my girlfriend Jennifer, my mother, um, my friend Kim, and my stepfather. Ms. Corcus, when the superintendent does that, we call that the spousal save. <laughs> Good save, Dr. Jenkins. You have her to thank for that. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Robinson. Oh, Miss Moore. Miss Moore. Yeah. The buttons push a little harder than the old ones. <laughs> um, you can be sure that I did not do anything to help my wonderful friends here get this job because I wouldn't have helped them leave a Pupka High School. <laughs> but Jennifer has been a wonderful addition at the uh, graduation last year when they introduced all the faculty and they, they said discipline and the whole, there was this huge sound across the whole crowd because she was just so loved and, uh, and uh, I actually have the honor of teaching her daughter Elena Flute. And so it's going to be a tough day, though. And Mom used to teach at Apopka, is now at Wakiva, and is a wonderful science coach and, and uh, been responsible for seeing the science scores go up, I think, over 40 points. Is that right? 36 points. And so anyway, Mrs. Robinson, you cannot have this family for very long. I want them back. <laughs> But uh, I'm sure they will love you over there. And, and uh, Elena is in the band at um, Lake Brantley High School. And so I have promised that I will actually cross county lines and go watch that band because it is certainly a wonderful marching band and very proud of Elena's work on the flute. So congratulations, Jennifer. Congratulations, Ms. Corcus. I look forward to getting to know you a lot better. I hang out at Edgewater a lot since my son and my mentee are both seniors there this year. So it um, seems like every day is the, what, did, what were we saying, the beginning of the end. So like it was the, the last first day of school and the last first prep rally. And, the, you know, so I will, be, I will be there with you all year long and getting to know you very well. So congratulations. We're glad to have you. We're glad you, we finally have another woman on the admin team. We've had a lot of men there for a long time. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but we do need some feminine, wonderful, sweet women around every once in a while, too. So, oh, Christine's saying you're tough. Okay, a sweet, tough woman. I like that. So anyway, I, get, I look forward to getting to know you better. Congratulations. You know, I have to chuckle to hear one of my board members worry about gender diversity cracks me up. <laughs> Come on, where's the love? <laughs> Miss Cobert. Uh, I just want to say congratulations to Elisa, and I can absolutely see why you are where you are today with such wonderful mentors like Mr. Loftus and Dr. Valley. And uh, I'm very happy to have you in, in this capacity as part of the team. Walker is a wonderful school. I'm so proud of it. And I'm also, I just want to remark and say how much I love that the, the board members up here really get to know our, our faculty and our staff. And, and I hope you see that that's how much you mean to us. We're very, very proud of you. Congratulations, Alisa. Ms. Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to congr congratulate Ms. Fuller at Colonial. It's a great team over there, has a long history of having a, a, a team that works well together. I know you're just going to be a wonderful fit, and uh, I'll be seeing you soon. So congratulations. Well, let me uh, close by saying congratulations to all of you. Uh, Mr. Hepper and I particularly want to say thank you for hosting us um, in your facility for the last four months. Uh, we love you, but we're not going to miss you that much. We're glad to be home. <laughs> Ms. Fuller, uh, you, you, may, you may chuckle at this. Um, my wife was a character at Disney for years, and they teach them no matter what to never break character. 
So when you introduced your colleagues, I've always wondered if when teachers go out for a cup of coffee or to a movie together, if they still say, hello, Mr. Smith, hello, Miss Jackson. <laughs> you just confirmed that you never break character either. So congratulations to all of you. Um, I do want to say, uh, I say to every group of newly appointed administrators, and this is more uh, for the benefit of their colleagues and their families and their spouses, that uh, these appointments really boil down to one word on behalf of the board, and that word is trust. Uh, the fact that you have been promoted to these positions shows that this administration and board trust your leadership abilities as educators. We trust your judgment. And most importantly, we trust our community's children and our future in your capable hands. So you should be very, very proud tonight. It's quite an accomplishment. And on behalf of Orange County Public Schools, thank you for all your service to our children. And with that, I've dropped my ice cream line because it's the start of the school year. So I usually say go out and buy your kids an ice cream because they came to this wonderful meeting. But they were wonderful tonight. Thank you all. And we're going to pause for a moment because it is a school night so you can get back to your, to, your, to your duties. And thank you for our principals for coming down as well. Chairman, if I might say, well, Mr. Hepburn's headed out. Um, if you look back this direction, we don't want you to think we abused your generosity using Edgewater High School. I do want you to know, if you'll see our CFO, there's actually, because you don't pay administrators for staying late for us to be there, their dedication and their work has earned for your school an additional $10,000. So you can see our CFO for those details. Chairman, now nobody will ever refuse to let us host our meetings in their schools. <laughs> All right. Um, let's go dive into our agenda. We do not have a very lengthy one tonight. We have no strategic plan updates, so let me make our preliminary announcements. Any individual who would like to address an item on the consent or non-consent agenda may do so by filling out a yellow speaker card. Uh, such as this. You can get these cards from Ms. McGill, who is the lady at the far left-hand side of the dais. And when that agenda item comes up for presentation, um, I will call uh, on you to speak at, at that time. Uh, at that time, if you'd like to address an item on the agenda, you will have three minutes to address the board uh, on that uh, agenda topic. Um, with that, um, Dr. Jenkins, do we have any changes to the agenda tonight? No changes, Chairman. Okay. and. Uh, since we have no changes, we don't need a motion to adopt the agenda because we've already done so previously. Uh, so let's go right into item 3.01, which is our budget hearing. I, I do want to say as a preliminary matter, um, there may be some questions from the board, but by the time we get to this point of the budget adoption, this board has gone through uh, two workshops, one rural development session, and um, uh, a previous board meeting. So I always feel compelled to say that when we adopt the budget because it seems like we're very silent, but we have pretty thoroughly vetted it by the time it gets to, to us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Jenkins uh, to lead us through the budget presentation. Thank you, Chairman. As board members will recall, uh, and as Chairman just uh, reminded folks, we've been through this on several occasions. I would like to, uh, at least for the understanding of the general public, indicate we are presenting to you a balanced budget as we are required to do statutorily. I will also um, gladly announce that we have taken care of the board's priorities, those things that you saw important, we've shared with you previously. Your tentative budget that was approved for the start of the school year actually has very minimal adjustments at this time, and your very capable CFO will take us through it. And let me remind you, this is the last time Mr. Collins, as your CFO, will be presenting your budget. Mr. Collins. Thank you very much, Dr. Jenkins. Um, we'll just jump right into it. This is the agenda for tonight. Uh, we're gonna start off with a presentation uh, of the proposed millage, presentation regarding the proposed budget, superintendent's comments, public comments, board discussion, and then we'll move right into the adoption of the actual agenda items. Of course, you can't talk about budgets without talking about property taxes. Uh, property taxes impact both residential 
as well as commercial property. Just to identify who is actually responsible for the various parts of your property tax, uh, we, the just value, your property appraiser actually determines the just value of the property here in Orange County. Uh, if you then you subtract the Saver Homes cap, and that's determined by the legislature, the actual uh, amount of that. Uh, that equals your assessed value, less your exemptions, and again, the exemptions were approved by the state legislature, equals the taxable value times the millage rate, which you have a part in that, establishing the millage rate. The legislature also has a part in that in establishing the maximum amounts that you can uh, establish for your millage rates. If you multiply it out, that gets your, uh, your property taxes. Now, the amount of money that we receive is, is based on uh, not only the values in the area, but also enrollment. This shows you the, uh, the values in, in Orange County uh, based on the EDR estimates, economic and demographic research estimates back in March. I, I showed you this chart earlier in the year uh, showing a fairly uh, symmetrical uh, growth in the taxable values here in Orange County. Um, once the actual taxable values came out in July, you can see that those, those values were much higher than originally forecast. Um, I'll also talk about equalization later on. Because our taxable values went up, it actually means that your millage rate actually went down and the state portion that you receive actually went down as well. Looking at your millage rate comparison, you can see the, uh, the change in your millage rates. Again, a slight decrease in your required local effort millage rate. This is what the state says that you must levy in order to receive any state funding. That number did go down by 0.256 mills this year because of the increase in taxable values statewide. So not only did Orange County's taxable values go up, but the taxable values of all of the property within the state of Florida actually increased beyond what the original, original forecast was. The discretionary millage is, is, is an amount that you can levy or not levy. Uh, if you do levy it, uh, not only do you receive the proceeds from the, the property taxes, but you also receive some supplemental state funding as well uh, to the tune of about $3.9 million. The additional voted millage is the amount that the taxpayers approved last, last fall. They extended that uh, for another four years. Um, and so that gives you your total operating millage of 6.718, and then you have your capital projects millage of 1.5. The, the 1.5 is the maximum amount you can levy for your, your capital millage. Um, I didn't explain, but the required local effort millage is an exact amount. You must levy that specific amount. You can't levy more. You can't levy less. Discretionary is the maximum amount you can levy by law. The additional voted is the amount that taxpayers approved, and the 1.5 is the maximum amount as well. One other quick point, the 0.256 represents about a 3%, a little over a 3% reduction in your actual millage rates for the upcoming year. Now this is confusing, so I'll, I'll do the best I can to explain what the rollback rate is. Uh, the ro rollback rate, if you take your current year taxable values, uh, less your new construction and additions, equals the current year adjusted taxable values. If you multiply that times the rollback rate, then that equals the prior year tax proceeds. In other words, you're, you're trying to determine what rate would you apply to the current year tax roll to get last year's revenues. That is the rollback rate. A little confusing to understand, and I don't always understand it myself. But we have to compare the actual millage rate to the rollback rate. The required local effort millage rate is actually 8.05% over the rollback rate, and the total millage is 10.18% over the rollback rate. And so that's what we had to actually advertise in the, in the newspaper. Now what does that, how does that impact the, the average homeowner? Well actually because the average homeowner is protected by the Save Our Homes legislation, their, their uh, increase in their, their assessment can actually only go up 0.8% this year because it's limited to either the lesser of 3% or the change in, in the consumer price index, whichever is less. This year, the change in consumer price index was the lesser amount. 
But remember, you had a reduction in your millage rate. So for the average homeowner, they will actually, of a $160,000 home, they will actually experience a net decrease in their taxes of about $26. Now on the other hand, commercial property is not impacted by the Save Our Homes limitations. And I will tell you that commercial property in, in Orange County did go up significantly for the, uh, for the upcoming year. For a piece of commercial property worth about a million dollars, uh, the commercial property owner will pay about a, an additional $2,000 in taxes for the upcoming year. That is primarily because of the increase in assessments in, in Orange County. Uh, again, that includes the 3% reduction in the millage rate, which you guys are, are voting on tonight. All right, let's go right into the discussion of the annual budget. This is the timeline of the events leading up to the, uh, the annual budget. And you can see the last item on the list is the public hearing September 15th, and that's where we are tonight. Looking at the, uh, just the summary of the budget, it maintains our focus on the district strategic plan. It preserves academic programs, retains highly qualified teachers, and protects arts, athletics, and student activities. It complies with board policies as well as state and federal requirements, and it includes the impact of our collaborative bargaining process. If you recall, we're actually in the second year of a two-year agreement with, our, with CTA, so it does in include that, and, and we will continue our collaborative process with OESPA as we move forward. Summary of the five funds. Uh, again, you can see the, the major change between what we showed you at the tentative hearing and now is that we amended in the, the carryover projects and the capital projects fund. And so now you see a, a substantial increase in that capital projects fund because we amended all of those projects into the budget for the, uh, the adoption here at the final hearing. The food service, pro uh, food service fund, uh, it, the special revenue fund only includes food service at this time. As we approve federal grants, we amend those into the special revenue fund as you approve those grants going forward in, into the fiscal year. Let's talk a little bit about each fund. The general fund is your largest fund for, and it's for operations. Primary source of funding is the FEFP, the Florida Education Finance Program. Mention again about equalization, and I'll show you how that actually impacts us in just a minute um, because the funding is equalized statewide so that if, if a particular district spikes as far as their property taxes it, or the, the actual taxes collected in a particular district, then that does impact the other districts in the state as well So because of the equalization process. Okay, looking at the actual FTE forecast, um, this projection is for 195,664 FTE, full-time equivalent students. It's an increase of 5,323 students over the end of last year. It's actually an increase of 7,136 over th where the budget was built last year to, to now. So it is a substantial increase in, in the number of students. Um, some of that growth is occurring in the charter schools as well. So this is, this is for the whole district, including our charter schools as well. Okay, this is the busy graph that we always try to explain uh, what it means, but what this shows is that um, we are now coming out of the recession and the revenues per student are beginning to increase. And you can see that the regular funding this year per student of $7,057 is an increase uh, over last year of about $174 or about a 2.5% increase. So earlier when I was talking about the, the large increases in the amount of uh, uh, assessments on our commercial property, it only yields about a 2.5% increase in per student funding because of the equalization pro process that took place statewide. Now if you add in the special millage as well, our, our overall uh, combined funding per student went up about 3.2% for the upcoming year. 
even with that increase, we're still, and, and considering the purchasing power of the dollar, we're still about $910 less than our purchasing power back in 2007 8 So we really haven't recovered yet uh, from an economic standpoint of, from where we were back in 2007 8 but we're on, on that trend going towards a, a recovery going forward. The percentage of uh, state general revenue going to education is up a little bit this year. Um, not nearly what it was in the pre-lottery days back in 1985, but uh, again, you see a slight uh, upward trend in the amount of state revenue going to education, and that's education in, in total, K through 20. Some people always ask about the lottery, you know, what's happening to the lottery dollars. If you'll notice in the early years of the, of the lottery, the green portion shows the portion going to public schools. And you can see in the early years, about 60 to 70 percent of the lottery dollars were going to public education. That number is now about 32 percent uh, going to public education. And of that amount, about 25 percent is actually for an enhancement program, which is the school recognition program. About 60 percent of that green bar there actually goes towards just base funding in the FEFP and the remaining 15 percent goes towards funding of our post-secondary program. Looking at estimated revenues by source, again this is the general fund only, uh, very small amount of federal dollars. The split is primarily between local and state and for this year there was a shift between state funding to to local funding of about a 2.3 percent shift from state funding to local funding, primarily because of the increase in your tax base. Appropriations, let's go right into your priorities. Remember that we had meetings uh, just discussing with the board what your priorities were. We tried to incorporate as many of those priorities as we could into this budget and we appreciate all of that input that we received and uh, worked hard to try to incorporate it all into the budget. Um, one thing I would point out is the first item, again, this, this is the second year of our two-year agreement with CTA, and, and there's, a, there's an actual reopener in the contract that says if the revenues, uh, if the revenues exceed $300 per weighted FTE, then we would reopen the salary negotiations. Uh, based on the revenues included in this budget, the actual increase is estimated to be about $126 per weighted FTE. So at this point, there would be no required reopening of your, your uh, negotiations with CTA. And you can see the other priority amounts that we included in the budget. And this is the, the continuation of that as well. I would like to mention at this point that there were a few items you're talking about the differences between what was presented at the tentative hearing to now, there were a few positions that we mentioned at the tentative hearing, a few resource teachers that did not get included in the tentative budget, have not been incorporated into this, this uh, final budget, and there was a shift in uh, some dollars between the IDEA, IDEA grant funded positions over into the operating budget or the general fund, primarily because of the cost of those positions, they were, they were increasing because of the pay raises that we, we, we gave last year, and IDEA did not increase at that rate, so we had to shift some of those positions out of the grant into the general fund in order to continue with those, those uh, continue the funding of those positions. Just a few other budget items, again, the health insurance goes up about 4%. Um, Two of the big items are down at the bottom, the teaching and learning and uh, information technology portfolio, about a $20.3 million. That's, that's your new student system that we're in the process of implementing currently, and a new, new, business, information uh, new business information system that we're uh, looking at uh, implementing in the future. Look at, looking at the functional breakdown, you can see there's really Everything remains fairly stable. Uh, the only increases you see is in the general support area. That's because of those two portfolio items, the, the student system and the, and the business system. 
They caused that general support area to, to bump up a little bit uh, over the last couple of years, and that's caused all of the others to come down slightly. But uh, generally speaking, your, your functional expenditures have remained fairly constant uh, over the last few years. Going right into the capital projects fund, almost $1.6 billion. Primary source of revenues is from sales taxes, property taxes, and impact fees. We receive minimal state support for our capital projects fund. Primary uses are for comprehensive, comprehensive renovations, new schools, capital renewal, debt service, and operations. That's capital operations, not operations in the, in the general fund. Looking at the five-year forecast uh, for revenues in the, in the capital projects fund, uh, you can see it here. Uh, the, the little sliver at the top of 2016 is the PICO money. We, got a, we have about $2.4 million that we have included in the uh, budget for 2015-16. And we did not include any more PICO for the other years because that's on a year-to-year -year basis. The other state money, which is that little orange portion at the top, that's primarily your, your it's a little bit of CONDS, capital outlay and debt service money, and also your, uh, your charter school, charter capital money that flows through us, and it'll flow out to your charter schools as we kick that money out to them. Again, you can see a fairly stable uh, scenario now because of our, our citizens who stepped up and, and approved the extension of our sales tax. So you don't see the big dip that we were looking at in the past. So the, the funding for our capital program looks, looks pretty stable going forward. Again, the use of the, uh, this is the, the upcoming year, the use of the, uh, the capital projects funds. Uh, some of the primary uses are for the additional schools. Uh, and I'll talk about the details of that in just a minute. Uh, comprehensive renovations and replacements, debt service and operations. Um, significant amounts are also planned for site acquisition, educational technology, and our capital renewal program. Okay, here, here are your five-year uh, new school openings. These are the, the new schools that will be opening. When I say new schools, these are the new capacity schools. These are brand new schools. They're not renovations or anything. And so these are the ones that, that are scheduled to open in August of each of these years that you see. So 2016 would be August of 2016 for each of those schools. And then you can see the rest of them. So we have a very aggressive, um, and by the way, the numbers, and I know all of you know this, but I just wanted to identify what those numbers mean. The, uh, the first number is just the school number. Uh, the school type, E means elementary, M means middle, uh, high, H, and then you have the PS8, and then you have a, a K8 as well on the list, actually two. And then the uh, learning community is shown next, and then finally the board member district, the last number on the uh, identifier. So we have three schools opening in 2016, uh, seven schools in 2017. Now we move on into the comprehensive renovation and replacement projects. Uh, again, remember most of this is funded from your sales tax that the, uh, the voters extended uh, for a 10 year period. You can see here in 2016 we have uh, five elementary schools to open in 2016. And when you combine that with the three new schools, you have a total of eight schools that will be reopening in that year. 2017, remember we advanced a lot of schools based on your direction. We'll have eight schools on this list opening in 2017. If you look at the seven that are opening that are new, we'll have 15 brand new schools opening in 2017. So that's going to be a very aggressive schedule. Uh, John and your, your gang, you're going to be busy. Looking at 2018, 10 additional schools that will be opening uh, in that year. In 2019 and 20, you have seven more schools opening in 2019, five more in 2020. Some of the other capital issues, um, and these amounts are including any carryover funds. You can see that we continued our, our painting program. 
Uh, site acquisition is planned for several upcoming uh, future projects. Um, based on Cove direction, we, we're trying to go out and acquire the sites uh, for any, any school that's within our 10-year planning horizon. We're trying to, to actively uh, acquire those sites for those schools. Our safety and security expenditures are based on your vulnerability assessment. Uh, the digital curriculum money is for the cohort three schools that will be coming online. Uh, charter capital, I've already mentioned that. And our buses are on a 10-year replacement cycle. So you can see that as well. Okay, moving into your debt service fund. I'll be kind of quick on these last funds. This is just where we accumulate money to pay for long-term debt. Uh, primary revenue sources is from your state capital outlay and debt service money that comes Actually, this money is the money that the state uses to pay off uh, some long-term borrowing that's done on behalf of the district. And then, of course, you have your, your capital projects fund that transfers money to cover our debt service. Special revenue fund. I mentioned earlier that right now the special revenue fund, fund only includes your food service program. The meal prices plan for the upcoming year uh, will increase and they were they were recommended by the Department of Agriculture to increase and we're going to do that over a two-year period this year the elementary student meals are increasing five cents secondary student meals are increasing 10 cents and adult meals are increasing 75 cents and that's contained within this budget internal service fund total budget of 300 million dollars comprised primarily of your employee benefit trust fund. We are self-insured, so this is where the money comes into the district from both your contributions on behalf of employees and also charges from uh, deductions from uh, employees to pay for their dependents. And we use this to pay for our self-funded insurance program. Again, I mentioned earlier that uh, incl includes about a 4% increase in your district contributions. Property casualty fund is placed for the property liability workers comp uh, and then printing services are also included in here. Okay that's it in a, in a nutshell and uh, these are the remaining items that have to take place. I'll turn it back over to the superintendent then we'll have public comments, board discussion and then we'll go right into the adoption of the agenda items. Thank you, Mr. Collins. Just a couple of comments. This, this is always a good time of the year just to remind the general public of the sheer volume, the sheer massive size of the district this board uh, oversees. Uh, 200,000 students, 10th largest in the nation, over 23,000 employees, and a $3.5 billion budget when you consider operations and capital. It is a major corporation quite an economic impact on Central Florida. And this board has seen to it that we are responsible corporate citizens. That acceleration alone for um, our community and for the construction industry means dollars invested in both income for some of our parents and employees in this area, but also dollars reinvested in the community where our employees live. I think it's also important to note the reason our budget is, our budget process is comfortable compared to several is again because of the generosity of our public. That half penny sales tax keeps our capital needs going. We're not making uh, tough decisions on where to replace roofs and where not to repair buildings as some districts have to do uh, on an annual basis thanks to the generosity of our public and then our operating budget is not stretched and not making cuts because of that half that one mill property tax that this community also agreed um, to put forward and extend for our children and so it's a good time of year just to thank the general public for their generosity for their support of the 200,000 students that we serve we are pleased mr. chairman members of the board to present your budget all right, thank you, Dr. Jenkins, and uh, Mr. Collins, uh, thank you. And I'm going to want you to pull back some of those slides. I'd like to make some comments, and, and I know the board would like to make some comments as well. 
Um, the first comment I want to make is just to echo something that the superintendent said. Uh, we want to thank the taxpayers of Orange County. We have a thriving public school system. It's been nationally recognized through the Broad Prize, AP Honor Roll, the Governor Sterling Award. But frankly, none of that could have been done without the largesse and the support of our community. It's enabled us to compensate our teachers fairly. It's enabled us to maintain art programs, athletic programs, after school offerings, uh, academic enrichment programs. And it's enabled us to provide for all of our students, regardless of neighborhood, regardless of uh, the, uh, the relative wealth of their neighborhoods, to have access to safe, clean, secure, modern uh, facilities. And that's not due to us. It's not due to the administration. That's due solely to the taxpayers of Orange County. So thank you very, very much. And, and we hope the progress is showing. I, I will say anecdotally that uh, my, 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 my heart was warmed about a month ago. And I, and I commented to the superintendent and some board members, I never thought in my lifetime I would read this quote or this story. But there was a story recently in the Sentinel where um, uh, one of the folks being quoted was quoted as saying that people are moving into Orange County because of the high quality of our public schools and our facilities. And again, all the thanks goes to the taxpayers for that. We've come a long way uh, in the last 15 years uh, as an institution. Um, also, those tax dollars, as the superintendent mentioned, we are trying to be good uh, stewards of those tax dollars. Um, as the superintendent put it far more eloquently than I could, um, it is a big economic driver, especially during the recession, the money that we were spending on our facilities program. We've tried to make sure that we spread that wealth among all segments of the real estate construction and uh, the trade unions uh, in our community. Uh, we also have a thriving and recently revamped it uh, MWBE program. And we also, in the last year, adopted a veterans preference uh, for our veterans, for them to have access to a slice of that construction pie as well. That was very, very important to us. I do want to make some highlights, and board members, bear with me, because I know all this is old hat to you, but there are folks who will be watching this for the first time at home. And there's so much here, but there are some things I do want to emphasize. If you could go to slide seven, Mr. Collins. First highlight I'd like to point out is um, that our actual military trade has gone down. It's a little bit of a misnomer in the public or, or, or a misperception that we have control <coughs> over our military trade. Uh, we have absolutely no control over our, our millage rate at all. The millage rate is set by the Florida legislature. Even that portion called discretionary is a giant misnomer, and this is coming from a guy who used to be chair of the Education <laughs> Appropriations Committee in Tallahassee. There's no discretion to it at all. Every school district in our state levies the full amount of the discretionary millage, or they lose access to state funds. So um, even that little part of that pie is a little bit misleading. Um, millage is set by the state, but thanks to increasing property values, uh, our absolute millage rate that residents are paying has gone down this year. If you could go to slide 10, Mr. Collins, please. Just go forward to. Even though uh, the millage rate has gone down, or, or partly because the millage rate has gone down, and partly because of the impact of the rollback, uh, this is important to this board for us to point out that the actual property tax paid by the average homeowner has actually gone down this year uh, in support of, of, of public education. It's tr true throughout the state. Again, I don't claim, and our board does not claim credit for that. That's really an attribute of the recovering economy. But it's something that is very, very important to a lot of folks to know that. Mr. Collins, if it's not too difficult, if you could go to slide 20, please. This is probably the slide that we as a board talk about the most when we're out in, in, in the community and the public. Because we want folks to know, and when I say we want folks to know, we want parents of public school children to know. We especially want our teachers to know uh, and, and our, our, our dedicated educators to know. And we want the community as a whole to know that although, yes, we are as a state and country coming out of the recession, however slow. Uh, the purchasing power of our dollars is down substantially over where it was in July 2007. In fact, were it not for the uh, local option one mill that the voters of this 
community voted voluntarily uh, into uh, continuation last November, we would still be down, even not accounting for inflation, uh, just in terms of raw dollars going towards education, because the part of um, that, that, that bar graph that you're looking at there, that is the money that we receive from the state um, for uh, our students on a per student basis is a blue portion of that bar. Uh, and it's only because of the local option one mil that we are up in terms of raw dollars above where we were in July of 2007. But a lot of folks believe mistakenly that because of that millage that we are somehow awash in dollars, this points out that we are still down by $910, $910 per student after adjusting for inflation. And I always point this out to folks because just like you and your home, you still have to pay your power bill, you have to pay for your health insurance, you have to pay uh, for your mortgage and all the other expenses you have in your personal life or in your business. Uh, we have the same expenses here at Orange County Public Schools. We have to pay to keep the lights on, we have to pay for our utilities, we have to pay for our insurance. So that loss of purchasing power does affect us and does affect our ability uh, to do things that we'd like to do more of, such as, for example, compensate our teachers even more fully than, uh, than we've been able to. If you could go to slide 25, Mr. Collins. A couple highlights here, uh, and board, I want to thank you for indulging me and let me go through this, but I think these things do need to be highlighted. highlighted. I see you nodding your head. First of all, compensation. We are in the second year of a two-year agreement. Uh, this board has been over backwards to fairly compensate and uh, our, our, our dedicated teachers and professionals. I speak for this entire board without equivocation when I say that none of us feel like we pay our teachers enough. Uh, none of us feel like we pay our beginning teachers enough. None of us feel like we pay our experienced teachers in particular enough. Uh, we all bemoan the fact up here at this board that we cannot provide even more of an allocation for our teachers. I will say, though, that with this budget, we really did stretch as hard as we could. Uh, and we asked the superintendent and Mr. Collins to stretch. And on average, we provided our teachers with a 6.5% pay increase over a two-year period in this most recent agreement. Uh, so um, that was something that was well earned by our, our professional educators. And we also provided a similar uh, increase for our support staff uh, as well. Uh, the other one that I know is very important to various members of this board and also that we hear continually in the community, we have dug deep as well to expand our CTE programs. That's education speak for our vocational education offerings. We as a board and administration are very attuned to the fact that while we would love in a perfect world for every student to matriculate to college and to get a four-year college degree, we know that that is not the case. Um, and that will never be the case, and a substantial percentage of our graduates need to be workforce ready when they graduate from high school. So we have made it a real priority of this board to expand our CTE programs, and more importantly, and we have stressed this with Mr. Armbruster, who heads up our CTE department, our industry certifications, because we don't want to delay any longer a child getting those certifications till they get out of high school. We'd like them to graduate with that certification, and, uh, in various ind industry um, uh, specialties, especially in, in um, technology fields such as Microsoft Office Suite and, and other applications that they need to be workforce ready. Mr. Collins, if you could go to the next slide. Two bullet points on this I do want to emphasize. One, we are going to be I believe by the time we get there, again, thanks to the sales tax in which we can also fund our digital program, our digital conversion program, we are trying very, very hard to get to a one-to-one -one ratio of devices to students. We are a number of years away from that, but we have been mandated to go to fully digital curriculum by the state of Florida. But as the state so often does, the mandate has not come with any dollars. We've received all of $9 million, I believe, last year from the state of Florida for digital uh, technology in a district of 189,000 students. That comes out to about $22 per student, if my memory serves me right. I'm not sure of my math there, but I think that's pretty close. So uh, if we just took the state dollars, we could buy a thumb drive for every student. That's about it. But um, we are able instead to convert over to uh, uh, devices and fully digital curriculum. We're moving towards it because we can use the sales tax dollars for that. 
Um, and we actually, uh, when it's all said and done, we'll have spent over $225 million uh, in converting to fully digital curriculum and to keep our students with skills for the 21st century. The last one on this screen I want to emphasize because this is very important to a lot of folks in the community. We heard loud and clear as a board and administration that from many of our parents of high school students in particular, and many of our high school students, I heard it in my own household, Mrs. Robinson heard it in her household, uh, that instruction had ground to a halt during the testing season because of the lack of access to computers. We're mandated to go to delivering all the state mandated tests uh, by computer this year, the, the required FSA assessments at least. Um, and teachers were being pulled out of the classroom to proctor test. And we can think of a lot better uses for a highly trained, experienced, skilled teacher than to be sitting in a room proctoring a standardized exam being taken on a computer. So this year, we asked the superintendent to allocate money in the budget uh, for us to bring in test proctors to uh, allow those teachers to remain in the classroom and instruction to continue during testing season. And uh, we were able to fund that so we can keep that going. The last points I want to make, if you could go to slide 31, Mr. Collins. This is one I like to talk about a lot out there on the, uh, uh, when I'm out there talking to audiences as well. There's this giant misperception in our community that somehow growth pays for itself. Growth does not pay for itself. People believe that, well, we pay impact fees and that pays for new construction, school construction not even close and nothing symbolizes that or, 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 or emphasizes that more than this chart. If you were to crunch the numbers there, you'll see that impact fees make up all of, and actually it's up now. At one point with the recession, it dropped down below 3%. Impact fees only make up 9% of our total capital budget. So impact fees or new home construction doesn't even come close to providing for the growth in our community. We grew, you heard Mr. Collins say, by 5,300 students this year. To put that in perspective, uh, that's almost five new elementary schools, or put another way, three prototype middle schools, um, or two new prototype high schools. So we are growing dramatically, and we grew throughout the depth of the recession. Uh, other counties were losing students. Orange County Public Schools, even during the depth of the recession, grew by 2,000 students per year. Last year it was up to 4,000 students, and this year it's up to 5,300 new students. So we are struggling a bit to keep up with the growth, but again, we have the voters to thank. If it weren't for the green part of that bar chart, we would be dead in the water. We would not be renovating schools. We would be struggling just to open up even uh, the modicum of the minimal relief schools that we need uh, to uh, accommodate that growth. Two more slides, Mr. Collins, uh, if you could go to number 33. Um, these schools that you see here, these 13, um, are the new schools that we're building. We get a lot of questions as a board. Why are you so late to build a new school? Why do you wait till schools are bursting at the seams? It's important for the voters to know that our money comes in tranches or installments. Uh, when the voters approved that sales tax, we didn't get, of course, written to us one singular uh, $2.1 billion check uh, in one installment where we could go out and immediately build. 25 new schools. It comes in every year in installments, of course, as you would expect. Um, we're fully bonded out to our capacity. We have no desire to take on any more debt in any event because we're a very conservative district in our finances, as we should be. We never want to have to look you all in the eye and say that we're in trouble with the state because of financial irresponsibility. And by the way, a number of districts in the state have had that problem over the last decade. Uh, so these are the 13 schools that we currently have funded in our 10-year work program, but I don't want anybody to have the misperception that this is all the schools we need because it is not. And um, we need even more relief schools in this, as you know from the growth numbers that you heard a moment ago. Next slide. Lastly, we made a commitment, and this is the last thing I'm going to say before I turn it over to Ms. Moore. Uh, we made a commitment to the voters back in 2002, this board did, long before I got on the board or most of us got on the board. I think Vice Chair Gordon was here at the time. To renovate 132 schools in this community, 133 schools in, in this community. Um, some of those schools had not been renovated for decades. 
Some of them, frankly, were schools that uh, none of us in this room could be proud of. Um, uh, it has been a 13-year program. We are nearing the end of that list, finally. I'm not sure exactly where we're at, Mr. Morris, on that list, but I think we're in the 90s now, uh, close to the low hundreds. Uh, we made a commitment that the first priority of the sales tax extension that the voters approved last year was to finish out that list. Some of those schools have been waiting uh, for renovation on that list now for 13 years since the sales tax was first adopted back in 2002. Um, so when you look at these comprehensive renovation projects, uh, that's very important to this board because of historical growth patterns and the growth in the suburbs. Um, so many of these schools that were in dire need of renovation were in the urban core, the inner city. Uh, some of our highest poverty populations. And um, I heard a teacher say once, and my board's heard me say this a dozen times, but it just struck such a chord with me a couple years ago. Uh, she said once to me when we were at one of our dedications for a newly renovated school, she said, you know, Mr. Sublet, when my kids come to a school and they get to walk into a school that's as nice as a school in the suburbs, it tells them that they're as valued by this community as those kids living out in the suburbs. And I think that's very, very important. We're very proud of our schools now in the inner city and the renovated schools um, because they are well nigh new schools if you were to walk into them and something, uh, they are facilities that any one of us in this room would be very, very proud to send our own children and grandchildren to. And again, thank you to the voters of Orange County for that, for making uh, that possible. Dr. Jenkins, thank you for your help in putting together this budget. And Board members, thank you for allowing me to make those highlights. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Ro Ms. Ms. Moore. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. That was a, a wonderful summary. I just had uh, one question for Mr. Collins, because it comes up a lot of uh, times when we're out speaking. And, and maybe you could help the public understand. Um, I, I think there's some confusion between the way municipalities in the county, how they realize increase in property values or decreases in property values than we do because of the equalization. So I think it's difficult when um, people hear that there's uh, you know, and I'd be curious to know what the percent of um, increase in value in Orange County, how it's gone up. And and so they automatically think because you hear the county commission or you hear, you know, your city has all this extra revenue that the school board doesn't get that. And I think it's, it's that piece about how, uh, and we get high marks on this in the nation for having a very fair system that takes all of the money, puts it in a pot, and sends it back out to students on a per pupil basis. So that's the first um, question, if you could explain it. And then when you see in the advertisement that we're required to do by Florida law, it, it was showing an increase of eight per, over 8% and that we're not going to the rollback rate. But there's the piece in there that doesn't um, accommodate for the increase in number of students. And we have the most growth in the entire state. So that can be misleading mm -hmm. the, to the public again. And the one chart you had was wonderful. We're actually, for the average homeowner with safer homes, is actually going to be paying less. So the main thing is if you could just explain the difference between how it works between municipalities and school boards. Sure. The, the, the slide here <coughs> essentially shows the, the total assessed values, the actual tax roll increased by about 16.5% here in Orange County uh, for the upcoming year. <clears throat> now, when you look at the actual increase in funding per student, even with the special millage that we have, it's 3.2% increase in, in per student funding. So you can see that because of the equalization process and because of the student growth, you mentioned that, that's another key, key uh, part of the fact of the formula <clears throat> because of that uh, even with a 16 and a half percent increase in the tax base itself you only yield about a 3.2 percent per student increase in funding again combination of equalization where if your tax base goes up well first of all the the, the millage rate went down statewide and secondly the, the proportionate amount of state funding that Orange County receives also went down on a per student basis. So those two things, and then secondly, the increase in the number of students actually offsets part of that growth as well. So all of those together, 16.5% increase in the tax base, 3.2% in per student funding. 
<clears throat> Vice Chair Gordon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. There it is. Oh, wow. Thank you. Okay. Um, first of all, I'd like to say thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the vision for this um, beautiful boardroom. It is, I think, attractive to the public, and um, our taxpayers deserve it. They really do to have a place that they could come and be able to view and see everything. So thank you so much. I, want, I really would like to thank Dr. Jenkins. Um, in one of her major evaluation, I think every board member up here knows she has to bring to us a balanced budget. And in order to do that, um, Mr. Collins, if you would go to slide 13 for me, please. Uh, on slide 13, you kind of briefly went over it, but as our cha chairman stated, we really don't want you to think that um, it, you just come up with the budget. It's a long process, and as the chairman stated when he was chair of the Appropriation Committee, that was, that was something very hard. We have to wait on Tallahassee. But you can see how many, we all also had community meetings within our district as it related to our budgets. And not only that, but Mr. Scott Howard, he's not with us today. He also put together legislative priorities where some of us actually got every legislator that affects our district and we did a major workshop here in the board in this boardroom and invited other board members and community leaders administrators from um, the particular school I know in school board district 5 we did a major legislative priority where we were holding all of our state representatives because we have more state representative in our in District 5 than any board member up here. So it was very important that our state legislators are not going this way and that way when it came to uh, the Tallahassee legislative priority. We wanted all of them on one accord. We also had senators that were thinking one way. And we have two senators in school board District 5, which was very important because um, we were on the line when it comes to this budget. And it, this budget means so much to me and the members of School Board District 5, as well as the members that sit on this board. But this year, this budget belongs to us because we've sat on this board from 2000 and never received a dime from this, even though the sale tax was written for us. But when we saw what was happening with the growth taking place, we were left behind. So I would like the public to know we are eternally grateful for what you have done for us. It took a long time, but we stayed the course, and now we reaped the benefits. So we are all reaping, but we are reaping even more because when you come last, even the Bible speaks about the first shall be last and the last shall be first, okay? And we were the last, and we're getting the best technology because now we're going to have to go back. Dr. Jenkins has to go back and redo a lot of our schools that were new and get them in. So sometime I try to tell um, the constituents in my district, hey, hey, it's okay to wait because if you wait, if you wait, okay, then good things come to those who wait. And this is our good thing. And I'm just gonna point out a couple as we went through the committee meetings, we went through the governor's budget, every member on this board went to Tallahassee and even Washington so that we could get our board together. And Dr. Jenkins did as well so that we can come back. Her job was to present us along with Mr. Collins a balanced board budget. And this is what we have before you today. The legislative sessions are always interesting. Board workshops are very important that the union is here so that they can give their input. Ms. Cato chairs the um, budget board for the board and then the union, they have representative. So you, I don't want you to think that this process just started. Right now, we're in the beginning of starting another timeline for the new budget process for the upcoming school year. So I wanted to point that out to you to let you see as a public 
and to remind our board members there are many, many steps that we have to go through. I would like to go to slide 25, and Mr. Chairman did point out a couple of things in slide 25, but I have to tell you about that. That was all well and good, but a couple of us got together at our before the retreat and meeting individually with the superintendent, and he pointed out the top of uh, the top four. But to us, there were several of our schools, Ms. Col Ms. Colbert's schools and my schools, did not have orchestras. Mm. So how in the world are you going to have a high school with an orchestra based on unitary status, thanks to that, where, we, where everybody gets the same thing, where the desegregation had to end? If you build it in this area, you build it in the south, you build it in the north, you're most certainly going to have to build that same type of school in the central. Well, we were left out again. Even up until this year, we did not have orchestras in our middle school. And with the both of us went to the superintendent, asked the superintendent to allow us. We even funded the music <laughs> program in some kind of way before we even got everything because we wanted the children to learn the music. So I'm, I'm sorry Ms. Garcia is gone, but I, want, I think that's why this board was honored for arts in our school at the Dr. Phillips Performing Arts Center. But to expand that orchestra program to all middle schools, Dr. Jenkins, I don't know how you and your staff did it, but we asked you to do it, and you went back with your talented staff and did it for us. The students are extremely happy, and when the music department is happy, pretty much everybody in the school is happy. Um, the next thing that was dear to our heart, which caused a lot of confusion in my district, and I got to point it out with the budget. You wait on the Lord and be of good courage. He will strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And why? Because when we decide to merge Richmond Heights, people couldn't understand it. The only people could understand it was Eccleston parents. They wanted their children back who were split years ago from Eccleston and they built the Richmond Heights School. When they built that Richmond Heights School, all of those students lived back by Eccleston. Now those students are in a beautiful, modern, technologically sound building that is just out of sight. But the babies were left out. I represent this board on the Community Action Board. Again, in our priorities, we went to the superintendent. I want you to know how things got here. And we asked her to partner with Head Start and Teresa, our county mayor, and that's exactly what Dr. Jenkins did. Not only did she open it up there, she went to other areas to make sure that we expand our pre-K program. If Mr. Rosen wants to come in and expand and put two and three-year-olds in school, why can't we as a school system expand our pre-K program? She have added, with this site, she brought to this board nine more sites. This is incredible because this is where the rubber meets the road. This is the education of our young children. And then with all of the killings and shootings and everything going on, the expansion of guidance counselors, returning them back to our middle schools and letting them be not paper shufflers, but real guidance counselors to work with and help our children. Another area that she saw that the board didn't see as well, and I want the public to see it, and we had to go to many work sessions, executive sessions, and everything else to look at expanding the safety and security enhancement of our school. Some people say, well, do you really need it? Even Sheriff Demings, um, a very good friend of mine, a church member said, well, I said, when you get with the superintendent and she give you the plan, we come back and get the plan, let's see what's gonna happen. Do you know what that's gonna do for the sheriff department in Orange County? That's gonna alleviate that sheriff department going in and handling things certain ways. It will help us to keep our children in school with our restorative justice program and all of the program that our superintendent is putting in. So I wanted to really point out those priorities and, and let you know how important it is and that this budget just didn't get here like this. If you would go to slide 33, Mr. Collins, for me, please. 
On slide 33, he talked about the school, and I keep saying, and I hope this just sings in your head tonight when you go home because it's your tax dollars. When I say wait, when I say wait five years, if you look on this, long time ago, you would never see the number five at the end. But if you look here, you will see three, number five, on the five-year new school openings. One time, we would never be anywhere on this. That is remarkable. You go to slide 34, which is the next slide, Mr. Collins. I want to just point out, people are saying, and Dick Batchelor came in, and they, you know, he, want, he chaired the half-cent sale tax for us. The first sale tax was for these schools. The first sale tax was for Tangelo Park, Carver, and Oak Hill, and Rock Lake, and Molly Ray, and Ivy Lane, and Orange Center. I can go on and on. But guess what? We didn't reap the benefits then. But I want you to know we're reaping the benefits now. And I want you to know about it. Because you may think that we're not getting our fair share. But I want you to know as I sit here, we're going to get our fair share. We may not get it at the time we wanted it. But by waiting now, it's a better situation for us all. So I wanted you to take a look at that comprehensive plan and see where we stand. Then go on to 35. We're not finished there. You take a look, Pine Hills. Pine Hills is still on that uh, on that list um, from our school, which I just think go to um, 36. And you have Gateway. You even have the Gateway School on there. And then if you go even a little further, you will have Orlando Tech. Then we get into our technical centers, and then you will have Mid-Florida Tech. So what I wanted to say to the public today, on behalf of School Board District 5, that's what I could speak for. I thank you from the bottom of my heart for not giving up, for hanging in there. And by the time this budget is totally approved, every school in District 5 will more than likely be brand new, except for one or two comprehensive schools that's already built. Everything else will be a shining diamond. And I thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank and you. board members. And superintendent. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. Well said. All right, Ms. Gould. It is on. Okay. Um, you know, I, I, I appreciate all of the work of the budget, Mr. Collins, and, and everything that has been done. I know we try to squeeze, as we used to say in the collection business, blood from a turnip um, when we are... Um, uh, trying to maximize our dollars. One of the things that is, of course, a great concern on my side of town is growth, and we talked a little bit about that in our capacity, and the chairman addressed the capacity. Um, we are bonded as far as we can be bonded and, and keep our ratings the way that we want to stay and, and healthy. Um, but I would like you just to talk about the next part of the cycle, which was on the calendar, but just to talk about the next part of the cycle. And, and it is a fluid as we look at projections going into the next year and so on and so forth, um, just so that we can keep discussions open as the, um, the county complexion um, continues to change as far as the number of students, where people are moving, how we're going to respond to that. Because, of course, we all hear about the overcrowding, and we still have schools in many areas that are overcrowded, in that, and we're going to continue to try to balance that. But I think just so that we can keep people in tune, this is, this is the end of one cycle and kind of the beginning of the next. Um, yes, ma'am, Ms. Gould. The if, if you'll take a look at the, the list of schools that we have planned for the next five years, uh, we go through a, a reevaluation of all of our new schools and the timing of those new schools every year. Our advanced planning group, which is comprised of uh, people from each of the departments that have various responsibilities, uh, transportation, facilities, budget, uh, everybody, uh, including people assignment, um, they all work together 
to take a look at exactly what you mentioned about the growth patterns that are occurring in the county and then we revisit the capital plan every year and then occasionally uh, uh, we, would, we, we would reorder uh, facilities based on that process. Um, the, I will tell you the closer that a school is to being built, the more solid the year of opening is. And that's really why we only showed the first five years here. Once you get past the five years, because of those, because of those growth patterns that occur sporadically, sometimes on the southeast side, sometimes on the west side, sometimes other parts of the county, we have to adjust our, our priorities and the timing of those facilities uh, based on the empirical data that's presented at that time. Thank you, and and I also want to thank the the board and the staff for working with all of us, not only to accelerate schools, as Ms. Gordon talked about, that needed that uplift and that regeneration, but to looking at that fluctuation in our market, um, in the entire area, and continuing to stay responsive. And 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 um, Mr. Morris too, and his new plan that he presented a couple years ago about how they assess the schools and look at the needs so that we can be much more responsive to real time, quote unquote, real time. It's never fast enough for anybody, but quote unquote, real time rather than kind of setting things in ice and not being mobile about it. So thank you very much. All right, thank you, Ms. Gold. All right, with that, if there are no other board comments. Uh, we're going to do this. We're going to first adopt the millage, and then we're going to go to adoption of the actual budget, and we do have a speaker on the actual budget. So um, let me take up the millage first. Uh, Ms. Cadle, do you have a motion for me? Yes. Why, why don't we, if you want to gather your thoughts, I can take the public speaker first. That's fine. You, you ready? Okay. Um, or we can take the public speaker because, oh, there it goes. Okay. You want to do the public speaker first? Let's go ahead and do the millage because he signed up for 3.02, which okay. is the actual budget. Whereas section 200.065 Florida statutes requires that the school board adopt a total millage to support the final budget and notify the property appraiser of its action. And whereas the 2015-16 final budget is based upon a total millage of 8.218 mills, which is more than the rolled back rate by 10.18% as computed pursuant to Section 200.065 Florida statutes. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the School Board of Orange County, Florida, that the board does hereby adopt the following total millage to support the final budget for the 2015-16 fiscal year. Required local effort, 4.970. Basic discretionary, 0.748. Additional voted, 1.000. Capital improvement. 1.500 for a total of 8.218. Be it further resolved that the superintendent immediately inform the Orange County property appraiser of the action of the school board in the manner prescribed by law. All right, can I have a second to that motion? Second. All right, it's been seconded by Mrs. Gordon. And yes, audience, we do have to read it that way. It's a requirement of law. Uh, is there any debate or discussion of that motion? Do I have anybody here to speak on item 3.01? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Should that motion adopted? All right, uh, we're now on item 3.02. Before we take up that motion, Ms. Cato, we do have one public speaker tonight on, on that uh, agenda item, Mr. Duck Head. Mr. Head, welcome. If you could start, Mr. Head, with your name and address for the record. My name is <clears throat> my name is Doug Head. Uh, I live at 1415 West Robinson Street in Orlando in the School Board District 5. Um, I'm um, here tonight um, somewhat freezing and probably with a worse cold than I came in with to, first of all, to urge you to turn up the temperature in your new meeting hall or else get us fur coats or 
something else uh, because I'm going to end up with pneumonia after sitting for an hour and a half waiting to make this presentation. I think that when you ask the public to come to speak to you, you ought to be serious about asking to hear from the public in a public hearing. That means get us up here to speak within an earlier time frame than an hour and a half after you've called the hearing. Um, I wanted to uh, just discuss the timetable of the process, the ongoing timetable of the budget. And the thing that um, has come to my con attention or people have raised as a concern with me, uh, they may not raise it with you, but we still don't have the final numbers and we will not for another month and a half have the final numbers for the past year. At the end of that past year, in several of the immediate past years, you've had $50 million left over from what was in the budget that then goes to where? And over this period of time, these funds seem to be accumulating somewhere. Are they, or they are rolled into the New Year budget, or they flow somewhere. And there is great concern in the teaching community, um, which has, if you saw that one graph where purchasing power hasn't kept up, well, the purchasing power of the teachers, as you know, is atrocious compared to what it was 10 years ago. And those teachers need the additional dollars. So if there is leftover money at the end of a fiscal year, I think the public needs to know what happens to that money, where it goes, into what account it goes, and what happens to it. So to the degree that you can explain that to the public in your budgeting process, to the degree that we can delve into it in the next and kill any concerns that there are about how it's somehow floating away or being used on technology when it could be used to pay teacher salaries. I think it needs to be addressed and I think it needs to be addressed in the process in a way that the public can effectively understand. All right, thank you, Mr. Head, for that testimony. Uh, Mr. Collins, can I, can I ask you to come up and, and address the points raised by Mr. Head and talk a little bit about the end of the fiscal year, the start of a new fiscal year. Talk also a little bit about the reserve requirements of the state of Florida, because this is a, a little bit of a common perception I think does need to be addressed and um, one that we've heard before from, from some quarters. Sure. Let me, let me go back a, a few years ago uh, during the, the, the real tough economic times that we were facing uh, when, when we were, uh, the, the, the state's revenues were, were bleeding, I guess would be the term, uh, and, and uh, the revenue trend was going negative. And at that time, uh, Ron Blocker was the superintendent, uh, Dr. Jenkins was the uh, chief of staff, and uh, the, the decision was made at that time to, to really freeze spending out, out of any what we call non-recurring dollars, which was our fund balance. It was basically your fund balance. Uh, because we wanted to preserve that fund balance uh, going forward in case we needed that money to help try to extend the, the contracts of some of our employees and not have to lay off as many staff. Um, so we did that. We basically shut down any, any expenditure of our non-recurring funds for a few years. Um, since the economy has now started to turn around, however, um, those non-recurring dollars, as, as Mr. Head mentioned, they do flow back into the budget for, the, they become the beginning fund balance of the next year, and they flow and they help fund uh, the new budget. Uh, I will tell you that the, the, the overall reserves of the district are declining uh, we, by, by practice now that the economy has turned around. And uh, so they, it, it declined last year. Uh, it declined again as of June 30th of 15, based on the preliminary uh, numbers that we have. Uh, went down about $15 million this year. Um, going into next year, we, we, we continue to expect a substantial uh, reduction in, in those uh, reserve levels. Now, is that something that's dangerous uh, for this board? Uh, at some point it would be. Uh, right now, uh, this board is, has adequate reserves to, uh, based on the rating agencies and the amounts that they require. Most of the dollars that are in your reserves are dedicated for specific purposes. Um, specifically, the largest portion of it is for your schools. Your schools' budgets that re re remain at your end, we do not take those dollars away from them. If a school has not spent a certain portion of their school budget at your end, 
we allow them to roll that money into the next year. Um, therefore, it does not force them to go out and try to make last minute expenditures at year end just to spend their budget to get rid of it. They get to make planned system, systematic expenditures going into the next year. So we, we felt that that's a more, much more prudent way to handle that. Um, so the, the bottom line is, yes, the, 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 any, any ending fund balance that we have does roll forward. It is shown in the, in the budget this year as the beginning fund balance. It rolls through your expenditures for the year, and then you end up with a, an ending fund balance number. That ending fund balance number that is forecast for the upcoming year is significantly less than the beginning fund balance that you're starting with. So you are, in fact, spending some of that money, and I, I will tell you that much of that is being spent on your, uh, your new tech technology projects, your, your, your student system and your, also your business system that will be, uh, begin implementation this year, Chairman. as well as some of your professional development. Dr. Jenkins. I, I would add, thank you, Mr. Collins. I would add, I think it's important for the board to note it has been your practice, and we believe it is a fiscally responsible practice not to commit recurring raises to non-recurring dollars. And you might recall there has been some information uh, regarding a county to the west of us that is now on the brink of having some financial issues because they dependent on non-recurring dollars, they run out. That's like spending your savings account on a recurring uh, expense. And so um, I think this board has been very prudent and very wise in how you've handled your non-recurring fund. But it's also important to note that uh, this board did use some of those non-recurring funds to give every teacher a broad bonus uh, on top of their raises in the past as well. And so we have invested large portions for teachers to get uh, dollars for uh, doing summer professional development for their broad bonuses. Those kind of expenditures are investments for our staff, but not deemed to be recurring, which is fiscally not advisable if you want to remain in the black. Okay. Thank you for that. And, and I'm glad you brought that point up because that, that was going to be my next point or question just to bring out that point. This board has very strongly taken a position, I think most responsible boards in the state of Florida have, that we are not going to appropriate non-recurring revenue, one-time revenue for teacher raises because then when we have a dip, then we're in a position of either having to lay off teachers or to pull back those raises, a position we never want to be in. Um, in addition to the Broad bonus, Dr. Jenkins, if memory serves me right, I believe during the depth of the recession, we did one year use some of that non-recurring bonus for uh, uh, dollars for a one-time bonus for our teachers. I think that was four or five years ago because that was uh, in a year when no districts in this state, virtually none, were giving their teachers any kind of raise. Uh, and this board uh, very strongly felt like our teachers needed some form of uh, financial uh, remuneration or compensation um, even even during the recession. So we did use it that one time, but historically we try not to. Mrs. Robinson. I want to thank Mr. Head. That's a great question. And um, maybe Mr. Collins, going forward, we could include that in our budget summaries when you do these every year and just go ahead and state it and, and make it a fact and explain some of the things like, like Dr. Jenkins was saying, where we did give out broad bonuses and those kind of things. Maybe, maybe that would be helpful to go ahead and explain that. Yes, ma'am. We can highlight that. It, it is included in the actual budget document itself, the detailed budget, but we would be glad to uh, and highlight that. And I have a that. question. Do you happen to know a percentage? You said a lot of those dollars remain at the schools because the schools were allocated the dollars and then they, they aren't spending them. Do you happen to know a percentage? You don't have to give it to me now, tonight, but I'm just curious how much of those dollars actually do stay at our 190-somethings out, you know, schools? I, I will have to get you an yeah, exact number. Yeah, I figured you'd have to. Yes. But would you mm -hmm. be able to kind of figure that out? Like oh, absolutely. X number stays here at this building and X number stays out at the 190-something schools? Absolutely, yes. Okay, that's a great piece of information. Thank and, you. And, and if you look in your in the actual annual financial report that you will be receiving shortly, once the, the – it's a long story, but the, 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 the required data necessary to complete our annual financial report is not has not been provided yet because some some of the information is coming from the state as soon as we present that to you we will we will highlight that information for you as part of the uh, annual financial report that breaks it out what portion is for schools what portion is restricted for other purposes and it even breaks out the individual uh, restrictions in the notes to the annual financial report 
Wonderful. Thank you. Mrs. Gordon. Here we go. I got to get used to it. Um, oh, thank you. Um, that was one of my thoughts. Um, this is not Mr. Head's first time asking us to do this. And even um, late last night, Mr. Head did write and ask us at what time will the board take public comments in their budget hearing? Mr. Collins, can you go back to your, that first timeline slide for me, please? And I and I and like I said, I love serving on the community action board because I learn a lot from other governmental agencies and how they handle public comments and private comments. So in this timeline, I would like to make a recommendation, Madam Superintendent, to this board for you all to take back, you and the chairman, because you set the agenda. And I did ask Deborah on behalf of myself and to contact Mr. Head. I don't know if they did or not, but I did ask them to contact you and inform you of what procedures that the chair would be using for the public hearing. I too feel, um, we, because we're so used to it, we know that the budget process and the hearing is coming, so we don't know. But he did say, and he said it over and over, and several other people have come before this board and said it. I think that we need to copy a little bit from what they do at the county board for even the community action. There's a section on every input where you have the public comment, and then they even do a private comment. The reason why, because some of us serve on the board from the private entity, and then we serve on the board from the public entity. So I would like to see us add that to our timeline and then decide people shouldn't have to, the budget is a major part, this is the taxpayer's money. Everybody should know when the public comment should be coming in. So, I mean, I have to say, Mr. Mr. Hand has been asking this year after year, after year after year after year. So I think in the timeline process, this is something that we could do as a board to go back for every one of these meetings that we have when we do the community input, let them know at this particular time, they will either come at the beginning or they will come at the end. Now, what the Community Action Board did, practically all of the comments used to become come at the end. They switched it. So one group comes at the beginning and the other group comes at the end. So they split up the public and the private. So we really don't have to worry about that. Basically ours would be public, but on every one of these bullets, it should say public comment begins at a particular time. And the reason why I'm saying that, we need to know because there are people that we may want to come before this board and address this board and we can say, well, the public input will be at this particular time. And I too had to write Mr. Head back and let him know, I don't know when, because it's at the, the chairman has that prerogative to set what he and the superintendent, where that comments need to come. But I think if we could, I make that recommendation that it be a little bit more public and that it be, that there's a section on the timeline for public comments and a time certain. All right, thank you, Mrs. Gordon. Ms. Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Actually, I was gonna say something very similar to the last two and, and to Mrs. Uh, Robinson, since I've been on this board, that's been one of the questions that's recurring is, um, you know, an eye to that um, funds. I think that was one of the first meetings I had with, uh, with a CTA member with um, Mr. Collins. And so it's certainly, I don't know if it's truly misunderstood or just <laughs> truly a wish that we could use that money. But, you know, it is explained that, as Mrs. Robinson said, you know, it includes the school's end of the year carryover budgets. It's encumbered or committed funds that haven't been spent and carried over. And I think that is highlighted in, or maybe not in the executive summary, but in the um, the full budget. But I think maybe from now on we need to include it, as Mrs. Robinson said, because it it, it not only is are they non-recurring funds, but it's a recurring question. 
And so uh, I would also support that, that we just include it in the, the, Thank you. In the, in the um, presentation with a clear explanation, because it's one of those things that sort of gets a life of its own and then takes off. <laughs> and the answer has always been the same. The question has always been the same. And so I think if we just head it off, we can um, answer the public uh, in a timely manner. Thank you. All right, great points. Thank you, Ms. Flynn. All right, I don't have any other public comment uh, on the budget. Uh, Ms. Cato, do you have a motion for us? I do. I move the school board of Orange County approve the 2015-16 budget for the general fund at one billion nine hundred million twenty nine hundred twenty one million six hundred eighty six one hundred seventy seven dollars. Um, I'm sorry, six hundred eighty six thousand one hundred seventy seven dollars. Approve the 2015-16 budget for the special revenue, $110,092,289. Approve the 2015-16 budget for the debt service fund, $224,419,000. Approve the 2015-16 budget for the Capital Projects Fund, $1,589,643,474. Approve the 2015-16 budget for the Internal Service Fund at $300,175,922. All right, can I have a second to that motion? Second. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, is there any further debate or discussion of that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. Show the motion adopted. All right, we are now on our consent agenda. Um, I don't believe I have any public speakers on the consent agenda. So seeing none, board members, any questions, comments? If there are none, can I have a, uh, Ms. Ms. Gordon uh, moves the adoption of the consent agenda. Mrs. Robinson seconds that. Uh, all those in favor of that motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed, nay. Show the consent agenda adopted. All right. We are now on uh, attorney report. Mr. Rodriguez. Can I before that? Yes. Mrs. Gordon. Agenda, we? we did. And you notice people. That's why we lose half our room every night. Right. <laughs> and, and, and people are still in the audience. And I, I know that I did want to highlight uh, the, the student FTE, how uh, the magnet program, the STEM program, it is 7.02. But we have members from Orange Center Elementary here. And, and I'm going to tell you this. These are longtime employees. Uh, there are only maybe about two of them I don't know as well. But Ms. Smothers is the magnet coordinator. If you would just stand. Okay, they, they are committed to be here, and they're on the consent agenda. I mean, they, they are ready to move this school um, back and put it back in the spot where it was. And, and this was number 7.02. Um, you just approved uh, the implementation of the STEM magnet program at Orange Center Elementary for the 2016-17 school year. And you know that we needed that. And then you have Ms. Grant, a STEM teacher that's here. Ms. Grant, if you would stand and, all right. And then Previn, if Previn, you'll stand. Okay, is she, okay, yeah, all right, there, there. All right, the, the, a man in the audience said thank you. Uh, and then Brandon, I think Brandon is here, STEM teacher. All right. And then um, these, these are longevity. These are, if I told them how old these others are coming up, they'll get angry. So they don't want me to reveal their age because they don't look it. But, I, but I'm going to say Pat Ivey was at Orange Center when I was at Orange Center. So Pat Ivey is STEM support. She's been administrative support to every principal that have come in. Gloria Anthony is a longtime family friend. 
And um, I worked for Gloria for many, many years. She's a STEM supporter. And then the lady that I'm introducing, she's a STEM supporter, but she's been one of the top teachers, and her sister just won that principal, um, Stephanie. Stephanie Shane, that was, um, that's her sister, and the dad was in the audience. Uh, Hope they come. Will you stand up, please? <laughs> she, now, Hope, just remain. Tell them how long you've been at Orange Center. Since 1986. Woo. Okay, everybody. <laughs> she did not leave. When you hear me talk about teachers, that are diverse and they hung in there. Everybody's not leaving the African American community. Okay, she has been there and she's like a, a just a gem in our community. And we love her. And then I do not know Saluti. I think is it did I get it right? You're new to Orange Center for me. Oh my God! Well, I've been on the board almost 20. So. That <laughs> Okay, so you're the STEM teacher, so let's give her a round of applause. Now, I saw Jada. I think Jada went home. Did Jada go home? That's Miss Anthony's sister. Um, that's, your, that's your niece. Yeah, Jada's Miss Anthony's niece. And we remember when Jada was born, and the parent was here, but she had to take Jada home. So Miss Anthony, when you saw Miss Anthony going out of the door, now they have been at Orange Center for I don't know how long. But when you have Miss Melanie Simmons, when Dr. Jenkins appointed her as assistant principal of Orange Center, you were a star in our crown. Will you please stand, Miss Simmons, and you? Yes. We thank you. And then, of course, the dynamic, none other than Talbert. I call it Talbert. But if you all remember Dr. Talbert, this is part of his blood, flesh and blood. Um, Margaret, they said Marguerite, you know. But it's Margaret Irving. Ms. Irving is a dynamic principal of Boyne Center Elementary. So board members, I wanted you to know, thanks to Boyne Center Elementary, they christened this boardroom tonight, or you wouldn't have had no schools here. Yeah. So, <laughs> so we, we thank you, and shirt. we just love your shirts. Love. We love you. We just thank Dr. Jenkins and her wonderful staff, Dr. Jesus Jara, the deputy superintendent. We all fuss about getting magnets in our, you know, in our school, but uh, this, Mr. This, the chairman and the board is really for having the superintendent look at the yeah. magnets and see which one is really wanted in our school system. So um, Dr. Christopher Bernier, our associate superintendent, for helping us, and of course, uh, Kimberly Marlowe and uh, the senior administrator Smith in the Choice School, they have done a fantastic job of helping us get this program there. So we salute you for staying the entire board meeting almost. And, and you were on the consent agenda. Nobody stays when they're on the consent. But the board, we all thank you. And Dr. Jenkins, thank you for giving us that magnet. Thank you. Now you, now you see why we call her Mama Gordon. <laughs> Nobody is prouder of her schools so than Mrs. Proud. Gordon. That's the Talk point. about fussing. <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Ms. Cato. Before. Mr. Rodriguez gives his report. I want to say a thank you to Mr. Rodriguez and to um, Attorney Eileen Fernandez. We were at the um, County Commission today. The opponents to the Wedgefield K-8 filed a motion to stay, and um, they were requesting that we stop building the Wedgefield K-8. Um, we started raising the walls yesterday so we're pretty far along on the building and it was it was five minutes each side um, it took the commission a very short time thanks to the leadership of commissioner ted edwards who has been so supportive of the school it was unanimously denied so um, we walked away from there saying that um, we're going to let the courts decide the final outcome if my if I'm correct, it 
it's figured that we're at least three months away from hearing something from the panel of judges. So um, the courts had requested that the county commission have this hearing. They had the hearing. They denied the stay. And so we're still moving forward. So thank you to um, Attorney Rodriguez and Fernandez. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez. That was pretty much the report, but we had one other component, which is the same attorney who's representing the Wedgefield uh, homeowners also representing the, the the folks out at West Orange now. They've had sort of a, uh, a change in their uh, legal representation. They have filed a similar motion in that matter as well. Um, we hope to prevail uh, and expect to prevail in both counts, uh, in both cases. Um, we, we are very comfortable in going forward with these, and as we advised you before, Obviously, there's a, a small amount of risk when you go forward and you've got a, a motion pending or an appeal pending, but given the law and given the facts in both of these scenarios, I think we will uh, see these schools go forward on a timely basis, and we look forward to uh, supporting Ms. Flynn in October when we get Avalon pushed through as well. So other than that, we have no other report other than the uh, joint meeting will be scheduled. We anticipate November 3rd with a work session in advance of that. We're still confirming a couple of uh, minor details, um, but uh, you'll look for a work session on the siting ordinance in anticipation of that joint meeting. And we hope to have it here in the new facilities. That's awesome. Well, that's terrific. Thank you, Mr. Rodriguez, and good news uh, on all fronts. We are. You know, we're, we'll have a work session before the joint meeting. All right, Ms. Moore. Um, I wanted to highlight one thing on this consent agenda as well, that, and I was just um, really pleased with the facilities folks. If you saw and under consent, under construction-related issues, uh, it was the documents for Lockhart Elementary School. And, 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 and a lot of times we don't get to share ideas uh, and things that have really happened in our district with one another, and I know we're going to do that with uh, Mrs. Cobert spinning quickly, but I just wanted to say thank you to staff. Lockhart, um, as Mrs. Uh, Robinson can attest, we, we, we share that that area is an area in decline and in a lot of ways is a community. And so um, we went to staff and the community came to the facilities folks and said, can you please save our historic building? And that, that building uh, first uh, the first administration area was um, constructed in 1936, excuse me, and so they were able to gut those historic buildings and of course some of the the other buildings that weren't worth saving are completely new and they worked so diligently to stay within the budget for it to not cost any extra, but the community will get to save the most beautiful building that's there and that remains to, to, to help spur on some other things that would ha occur. We're seeing the county commissioner look at partnering to do some other improvements, working with homeowners. And so, so many times we see our projects, they're the gem of the community and they provide the, the basis for which we can see the entire uh, community and neighborhoods start to improve and be stronger. So I just really want to do the shout out to the facilities folks about how impressed and thankful I am for what they did at Lockhart Elementary School. Thank you, Ms. Moore, for that. All right, let's go to the superintendent's report before we get to committee reports and then just general discussion items. Dr. Jenkins. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, three things briefly. Uh, number one, we are very pleased that we will have our third annual expectation graduation event on Saturday. It is when we have principals and staff members, social workers, teachers, administrators um, available at all of our high schools, but specifically going into communities from selected high schools to regather any of our students who may be considering dropping out. And we're just not willing to take no for an answer. First time around, we're going to have to see them again and see if we can encourage them to come back. Very pleased this will be our third year under the very capable leadership of Dr. Lawson. We'll be doing it. I have done uh, one in the Apopka community. Last year we were in the Dr. Phillips community. This year I'll be with the team going out from the Evans community. What I'm more pleased about is over those three years we have regained 163 students back into the system that were potentially uh, considering not coming back. And of those students that we've been able to regain, 36 of them have actually graduated at this point. So we're very pleased. 
I have to tell you, it, it, even if we gained one student back, it would be worth the effort. We want no child um, to lose out on what a high school diploma can mean for their future. And so we'll continue those efforts, certainly looking forward to it on Saturday. And then I have two awards to mention. Uh, one is for our chairman who will receive the Spirit of Achievement Award honors as an active business person in Central Florida, uh, having made significant contributions to private enterprise in our community. He has worked and nudged the Central Florida community in a better, stronger direction. That is from the Mid-Florida Business Hall of Fame 2015, Chairman Sublette. <laughs> Secondly, let me just read a portion of a letter from the Council of Great City Schools. Congratulations, Mr. Sublette, on your selection as one of the Green Garner Award finalists for 2015. You and your district should be very proud of this honor. You have shown a strong dedication to the needs of your students, a profound commitment to improvement, and have exemplified significant community involvement and leadership. One of the finalists to be determined on October 8th in Long Beach, California. Congratulations again to our chairman. Oh, that's an well, honor. thank you for that. And, and you know, I, um, board members, I really truly mean this, and Dr. Jenkins and your entire team. Um, these awards really are team awards, and uh, I would not be being nominated for any of these awards were not for the um, hard labor and work of your team, Dr. Jenkins, and your folks who make us all look so good up here at the board. We really appreciate it. And board members, um, your hard work. I, I feel like whenever we get one of these awards, it's a collective award. So um, I hope you can be there with me at the Junior Achievement Dinner because um, I'm going to point that out to the audience. But uh, thank you um, for, for pointing that out, Dr. Jenkins. Um, I think we don't. We have I don't think I find out till I'm at the Council of Great City Schools. That's correct. That's correct. You won't know about the um, Green Award until that actual evening um, at the council meeting. We have a table available for board members for the JA event. The date. I'm sorry. Is it November sixth or something like that? November fifth. At six p.m. And with the Green Award, they you really have no idea. And um, Mr. Blocker and I didn't realize there was a table up front we were supposed to be sitting at. So really? look for the table. It didn't like say Orange County or my name. And they're like, we didn't think you were there. And I was like, well, Mr. Blocker and I were in the room. So you have to. It's it's very secretive. So look for kind of the table in the middle that's uh, and just let them know you're there. Thank you. I will do that. Oh, Cat Gordon will be with you. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'll have my own cheerleader section, the loudest in the room. <laughs> if you've ever been to that, that's a big room with thousands in it. But they'll hear Cat Gordon, that's for sure. Thank you, Cat. You're my substitute mama, too. That's right. I'm going to look out for you. Thank you. All right. Um, board members, committee reports. Uh, Ms. Moore, communications. You did? Okay. Um, Community Action Board, Ms. Mrs. Gordon. Uh, thank you. If you would, um, if you look in your packet, I really want to talk to um, Dr. Jenkins and the board, and I think Dr. Bernia. Um, you know that the Community Action Board, and you all got to put me on the agenda because I do represent you well. They love me over there at the Community Action Board. They really do. I'm serious. And they know that Orange County School Board is there, and we always bring something um, that's going to help the Community Action Board. We offer things for them. We have helped them to place the babies, you know, in our school, which are our babies. There's one important report. Usually I put down your centers because they look for you to work. That's, that's our plus. That's our parent and community engagement where the community action board centers like joey has the east center um christine has john bridges pam has maxi um, and pine hills we share pine hills and maxi uh, nancy shares pine hills with us also and then linda has taff and christine have willow street then i have southwood bill has all so they look at you Bill with all of them, but I have Pine Hills 
and then I have Southwood, Lila Mansion, and Holden Heights. Holden Heights is a brand new center. Uh, right on Orange Blossom Trail, you would not recognize it. It is gorgeous. It is a place where everybody's meeting, and uh, the center is pretty much over capacity now. It sits in the heart of um, just before you get to um, I-4, the underpass. You really need to go and visit that center. It is beautiful. So they look for us to help in the center because they are always working with our children. They're always working with our children. They're always, they majorly, every center gave book bags. Every child in that center, Dr. Jenkins, was taken care of. If they didn't get it, they came back and asked us to contribute. And I, and I would find it robbery if I don't come back and tell you, they get no recognition here. They're not even listed. And we represent, you know, on the committee reports. And they give a thorough report every every board meeting when there's a meeting. And I do think that that needs, this is a partnership that we have built with the mayor of the county. So we really have community engagement at its best because I'm kind of touching bases with most of these centers throughout because I know I go all the way to Christmas up in that area and love because they get angry if you don't come up there. But I want you to take and look at one goal it's um, on page five. Dr. Jenkins, we really, this is a challenge for us. When the, when the board reported, they reported their goals and they reported their outcomes. Some things they had accomplished because these are our parents that need jobs. There were 80 parents in our school system that we targeted to help get jobs and they have school-age kids, but they were only able to achieve 66. We have got to get with them and find out who they already know who these parents are. They're in our schools. We got to get with our tech centers to see what training we need to give these parents that would help them become gainfully employed. And then it goes on to um, the, the, uh, the, the increase in their benefits, and it names their health care, but the one that I picked as the goal that I would work toward with the superintendent, and I've asked her if we could work with Dr. Bernia. They, we had a goal to get, just on this particular one, 10 GEDs, just 10. And you know they, we don't pay for it. They do it for us, and these are our parents. We only got three. You know why? I want to say it's tough. I want to say it's tough as you know what, but I just got through preaching, so I can't say <laughs> tough as the other word. But, but I'm, we, Dr. Jenkins, let's see if we could get with Mayor Jacobs and her and Mr. Bell and let not that happen again. They have money for, they know to take care of Tan with the family, getting them the job, getting them back and forth, but we were only able to do three. Then Christine, they are increasing the number of GEDs in your center, okay, for the students because it is needed and it's needed badly. And then they plan to go to all of our centers. So Dr. Jenkins, if we can take that goal and get in touch with Mayor Jacobs and Mr. Bell like we've done in the past and say we, with Mr. Bernie, could say we can help you achieve this. So when I make this report next year, Hopefully, at this time, though we would have exceeded our goals. So, Mr. Chairman, that is our report. I wanted you to know how important the Community Action Board is with us in helping to educate our children and our adults. Thank you so very much, board members and superintendent, for your support. Thank you, Mrs. Gordon. We'll, we'll, we'll make that sure that that's a regularly listed item on the report. So, I'll have Ms. McGill do that in future right, meetings. Thank you. All right, uh, general discussion, board members. Uh, Ms. Flynn. Yeah, because I mean, I go, I take my time. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, I'm sure I'm not the only board member who had parents um, uh, come up to them, come up to them, and at some point say, um, "You know, I'm an engineer, or I majored in math, and I can't do this darn math." 
And, you know, back in the day, I learned it this way. We sent a man to the moon. And why are they doing it differently? So um, I asked uh, Dr. Fritz if we could put on a session for parents um, on the standards. And that's what we did last night. Uh, Dr. Fritz and his team um, just prepared a really dynamite 30-minute presentation preparing our children for a bright future with the Florida standards. And there was an emphasis on the, on the uh, English language arts and math. And they videotaped it. And so it should be available for other uh, board members to view or to send out to their schools or put it on YouTube and um, maybe reach out to more parents to view it. And can I announce the, uh, the parent instruction videos? So for those people who came to my meeting last night, they were actually able to hear about the announcement of these parent instructional videos that are online at OCPS that were developed by our people. And they're very small instructional um, uh, uh, suggestions for parents to help for that each nine weeks. And, and it's from K through well high school courses, mainly like algebra you know, and geometry. But each each grade will have uh, the reading part and the math part where they'll give five tips and um, the parents were excited about it the principals were excited about it um, one of my title one principal or district two title one principals and pta uh, president's very excited about it in fact she sent me an email where she sent it to all her instructional staff for um, presentation on their open house you know, ask the teachers to be sure to show these videos. So it's just another another resource, not the only resource we have, another resource. Um, I received a comment about what about parents who don't have access at home to the internet? And I think this is something where we can make our, uh, again, it's just another resource, but make our media centers open to our parents. Um, I understand a lot of smartphones, uh, you know, people have smartphones versus, you know, the internet. So certainly uh, just just more outreach more um, more options for our parents. So um, we're all very impressed. So um, uh, Dr. Jenkins, I just want to compliment you and your staff for uh, a great presentation. Thank you. That is terrific. I think uh, a lot of us would like to see those. So yes. I'm, I'm, I'm going to look to look look for those, Ms. Flynn. Well, the presentation we'll have soon. The online videos are on OCPS right now. They are. Okay. So you go into the parent. Yeah portal, or not portal, uh, the parent page, and on the left there'll be um, parent instructional videos, and you just click, and it'll just show all the grades. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, pretty impressive. Yeah, it's very cool. Thank you, Dr. Fritz. That's awesome. Ms. Gould. Um, just in follow-up, the a suggestion, everybody should put that in their newsletter, and if you have a Facebook page on your Facebook page, so we're consistently putting that message out there to those connections. Um, one of the things, um, I went to visit Dr. Pope today, and she was going to pass this message on to Dr. Jar because his door was shut, but I wanted to bring it up to the board. We have so many new families and students um, joining uh, Orange County Public Schools now that um, it, it's kind of in follow-up to something you're saying. I would love to see a maybe 30-minute welcome or end of the um, parent academy time and maybe some other opportunities at the school for people who are new to OCPS, whether they're coming from private school or brand new to the county, but they don't, I had my uh, round table last night, my table talk, and I had a brand new parent there who's actually been in the community a long time. She came from um, uh, St. John Davini, um, her, her daughter had been there and going to our middle schools, but she had no idea the depth and breadth of what is available in OCPS for her child, especially as they move into high school. So I, I think if there's kind of a, a 101 what's at OCPS that we can put together that gives a nice overview of, of all of the things and the resources on how to get there, I don't wanna overwhelm them, but at least give them kind of a pathway. Um, another thing that came up that I know we were pretty vigilant about last year, but um, I haven't seen it as much this year, is the discounts for internet access 
to that our partners are offering for those um, that that are socioeconomically challenged. So if we can kind of refresh and put that back out there and make sure everybody is aware of that dramatically discounted internet access. Um, and then I, I wanted to circle back about the school siting. Um, we had at one point discussed having a community committee also with that. And I wanted to try to get a sense of where we thought that timeline was with the workshop, the committee, and the joint session, because I'm getting a lot of questions from interested parties in the community. That's a great question. Um, we do need to get scheduled, um, and I made a note here when we went over the work session schedule to make a point of asking Ms. McGill to get it on to schedule a work session before the joint meeting. So that will happen. You, you have my assurance we'll get it uh, the work session. That was the original plan. I think we had to cancel it and move it because of some events. Um, so, but we need to get that rescheduled. Where are we at on um, the group that we appointed meeting? Um, Ms. Moore, were you going to head that up? I hate to look at you. I'm, who is it? I don't know that we had anyone in the Yeah, I don't know. That, yeah, I'll, let me get with Mr. Rodriguez on that because we have our appointees to that that we went through you were at that meeting and you're right they do need to meet so um, let me get to with mr. Rodriguez on that and we'll get that scheduled as well because it is September 15th it's a good point miss miss gold and things are moving fast now all of a sudden we were sort of in a holding pattern for the longest time okay all right um, miss Cobert thank you I just wanted to share that last week Mrs. Gould and I had a joint town hall meeting. And it was so well received. We had nearly 100 people in the room. Wow. It, was, it was a full house. Um, the feedback from that town hall meeting has been extraordinarily positive. And one, one of the things that some of the, the parents said was how nice it was to see their government officials working well together. And I think that that's something that we're not seeing out there very often. Parents loved the information, and I also want to um, give a lot of credit and thank you to Marilyn from School Board Services. She did a wonderful job assisting us putting together that presentation and getting the word out to parents. It was very, very well received. And they also did record it, and I had a lot of my PTA presidents say, we'd like to show experts, uh, excerpts of this at our PTA meetings, or we'd like to put it out in our newsletter so that, that more parents could watch it. But I wanted to share how well received that was, and I wanted to invite any of my fellow school board members where our districts overlap. So Mrs. Uh, Robinson, Ms. Flynn, Mrs. Gordon, where our districts overlap, we might consider doing that because it was so well received. Yeah, thank you. Hey, where was it held? We held it at the Hunter's Creek Community Center. That's terrific. That's right. And how did you get the word out? Oh, Marilyn's a master. Yes, uh, we, Marilyn was really, really instrumental in that. Uh, Facebook, email, our newsletters, flyers. The schools put it on their marquees. They posted the flyer inside. Connect Orange. Um, really a wide variety of, of methods. And it was overwhelmingly positive because we shared the hot topics of what parents want to know about and then made ourselves completely available to the public to ask the questions that they often don't get answered. And we invited the homeowners association. Yeah, there were members of the community at large as well as parents and teachers and uh, administrators from our schools, very well received. That's terrific. I, you know, I only ask because we've all done town hall meetings, but folks not in politics don't realize this. If you get more than 20 at a town hall meeting, that's a smashing success. So the fact that you got over 100 people, that's, that's incredible. Good job. Yeah, that's incredible. Great job. Ms. Moore. I wanted to just to highlight something as well. I, I was really pleased when we were looking at the enrollment numbers and comparing to some other Title I schools um, that Phyllis Wheatley Elementary is up about 7%. We have another 45 students this year. And so I want to thank uh, you all for voting 
with me to rezone some students and we've I did a lot of PR last year between bringing the Chamber of Commerce the real realtors whatever group would come the ministers to the school so it really is exciting when I hear all these things that we're doing because it has the potential to really strengthen our schools and, and mr. chair you were you were there when we were on the upside of it back I guess with dr. Jenkins in May and it's just continuing to go in a in a positive direction and so in that light I just wanted to share um, I have two schools that went uniform this year was a uh, level and a popka and we're hitting about 95% compliance already and so I had promised um, the schools if they did that we would have a little celebration so on Tuesday we have um, Commissioner Nelson in the fire truck from Orange County at level and get and put uh, the uh, reporter from the Apopka chief up in the bucket to take a picture of all the children. And then over at Apopka Elementary, the mayor is really getting into it. He's getting them I Love Apopka stickers and bringing his assault vehicle. I said that was scary, but Mr. Wright said that's because I'm a girl. He said the boys would love it, so I guess the assault vehicle, whatever you call that thing, is coming. Girls like it too? Okay. So anyway, now they're having a little competition between the two of them and Apopka is working with the high school students, their engineering students, to figure out how they can line all the children up in an A. So we'll see if we can get that done. But um, anyway, it's going to be a, a great token. They're brand new schools, thanks to this board. And so then we'll have, for the history wall, we'll have a picture of every child who was in that school the very first year that it opened. So like I said, I'm looking forward to, I love hearing all your little stories. I didn't know about the, the town hall meeting. So it's fun that we had a few minutes to share our stories because we don't always get to hear. Thank you. Mrs. Robinson. Buttons got me a little, I, I gotta push too hard. Um, I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about something that I did this weekend that was awesome, but but piggybacking on your uniform thing, one of my middle schools went to uniforms this year and they're having 90% compliance. Yes. And the kids are loving it, Lockhart Middle School. And I wanted to thank um, Linda. Linda and I went out last year um, when they said, we need help with this. And they heard that Linda had, had helped several schools turn into a school that was following the uniform policy. And she went and gave them her words of wisdom. And they had the SAC and the PTSA and all the kids on board. And they look so cute. Wonderful. They look so wonderful. So I just wanted, now that you mentioned that, I thought I'd throw that out. So for a middle school to do it, that's really exciting. Um, but I went Saturday to the Parent Academy. So I missed Miss Gordon's birthday celebration. But I went to the Parent Academy, and it was phenomenal. And I wanted to tell everybody how fabulous Ms. Schuler's department did putting that together. There were five to 600 people there, and they learned, they had all these breakout sessions. They learned everything from just how to encourage your child to be a reader, to talking about IEPs, to talking about, I mean, so many things. It was wonderful. Fed them lunch, and, um, and they gave out, you know, the big award. And I'm not kidding. It was a huge award. That thing is, oh, and who won? I, I mean, I'm not telling who won. <laughs> anyway, my school got third place, thank you. But anyway, this award, I'm not first. kidding. I'm not oh, kidding. Unity. The, unity. Award, Love unity. the award is taller than me. The thing is so huge. Um, so anyway, it was really, it was a lot of fun. It was really exciting. That was my first time um, being able to go to a parent academy, and I just, am so, it's just amazing. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And I guess those uh, videos that, that Ms. Flynn was talking about, those will be possibly some more parts of Parent Academy coming That's forward. Correct. So anyway, and can y'all get a link to all of that or somehow, because we're going to need them for our newsletter, those. We're getting the links for Perfect. you. Perfect. So anyway, thank you, Ms. Schuller. It was awesome. That's Wonderful. I, I, would, I would add one thing. Uh, thank you for highlighting that. Over 500 in attendance. I opened it, but I had to go to another event by the time you got there. But here is what was shocking. I, I asked the group when I was standing in front of them, how many of you, this is the first time ever you've been to a parent academy? And almost everyone raised their hand. First time attendee. So we were very encouraged by, by those numbers. It was a great day at Edgewater. Ms. Flynn. Thank you. Well, the interesting thing about Oh, which school won? Which was, uh, oh, I'm sorry, rivalry love, rivalry you love. Just, you just couldn't go home tonight without saying that, could you? It was just eating at you. I couldn't, I could I could But you know, what is the interesting about- The third place trophy's this big. <laughs> but what is interesting about the District 2 school winning is that it's, 
it's it's all the way over off of Narcusi on the other side. And so I think what's remarkable is that this is drawing, it, it used to be sort of regional, you know, if you had it over in the West, it drew from the West, if you had, and that it's drawing from all. So congratulations on the team for putting that on. It's becoming a, a county um, wide. So we're gonna keep winning it, but oh, rivalry love. Okay. The, <laughs> I'm horrible, you know, and, and and I'm also, you know, I'm just, sometimes I think I, I still have to stay in sync because, you know, I just, um, I like the whole individuality and I know I'm in between two uniform people, but I'm just old school and like, let the kids go to school and wear what they want. But anyway, um, I wanted to go back to something that Mrs. Uh, uh, Gould said about all the resources that we have, but it, this was an article in the paper and then I saw it, you know, on social media that was sort of reinforced is that there are so many online resources and links that our parents go to. Edmodo, Progress Book, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not on it. So, and so if it, yes, I understand. And, and you know, the article that was in the paper was sort of humorous, but it, it hit a nerve with a lot of parents. So I don't know if there's a way that we can um, s not streamline it, but bring it together to sort of, yeah, to sort of be a um, a list of what's there. Just sort of a quick down and dirty directory of where it is, sort of bring it all together. Um, that might be helpful. We could put it out there on social media. So I just wanted to bring that up. I'm done. I'm done. I'm going to go congratulate my school. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Jenkins, um, I know this is uh, a little bit off script, but the, the student, we've, the new student progress system that we've been anticipating for, it's coming, I know. Will that address some of that at all? Uh, will it standardize it all? Or will we still leave it up to the discretion of teachers? Because the article did hit a nerve, and you know, it's not just even the ones he talked about. Most of my daughter's teachers in high school use Google, Chrome, I'm not even Google. Google. I'm not even sure because I don't use it myself um, for 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 posting of lessons and other issues. And when you add that to Edmodo and Progress Book and all the others, so. And I think it's good. Think that, that's, that's an excellent question. There'll be some standardization. We have to realize there are very different functions. A student where the students are to interact is very different than where the parents are to interact, but we'll see some uh, alignment when we have our new student, yeah, alignment when we see it, when we get our new student information system in place. Um, but certain things that are part of the digital curriculum for digital learning for our students will remain separate. Uh, Mrs. Gordon. Okay, all right, all of this excitement about the Parent Academy, I'm gonna say welcome to my world. Let me explain to you all about the Parent Academy. It has never been in any region. Everybody that has been coming to the Parent Academy has been coming from all over the county. As a matter of fact, those that have been winning those trophies have been from all over the county. It just happens so that District 5 usually wins the first place trophy. Now, I this is the first, I'm very competitive. I'm very competitive. I need Dr. Shula to the podium, uh, Dr. Jenkins, because I'd like to know, or Dr. Joy Taylor, I'd like to know who won, because I'm going to put a challenge out, and I will, I, I've never lost a trophy, and not only have I not lost a trophy in other people's district, we whipped the devil out of you in your own district, so... I'm, I'm here to let you know, I can't believe because I missed one parent academy, we lost the attendance. Yeah. I believe they cheated. I can tell you. I, oh, cat, come on. <laughs> because we've never lost. We've never lost. So, uh, Dr. Shula, uh, Dr. Jenkins, will you please ask Dr. Everybody Shula? Everybody was her birthday I need party. to know who won because, um, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to challenge you all bragging about the trophies and what was big and what was little. I'm going to challenge you in just a minute. So, we can certainly have a recount. That's right. I'm demanding a recount. I've never uh, lost a trophy. Let me say, officially, first place was Eagle Creek. Second place was Lake Nona. 
And third was Evans. Well, I'll be dog. So what I'm going to say, from now on, I'm going to challenge my board members to pay for the trophies. <laughs> okay, let me tell you why. I would like to challenge you. I'm not going to ask you because uh, that is a commitment that I made. But since you all bragging about how big they were and how little they were, that was our <laughs> challenge. We have won every single one. So if you all are interested, please email and deposit your budget into the trophies account, and we will be very grateful. And then I'll come back and whoop the devil out of you and take my trophy back. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. I can't believe we lost. Yeah, once again, I got to follow Kat. We lost. It's so unfair that I have to follow Kat again. <laughs> we lost. Um, I forgot. One, two important things. Speaking of rivalry, love, and I'm going to talk about love, <laughs> not rivalry. But we had the um, the West Orange High School um, and uh, Dr. Phillips game last week, and we had about 6,000 attendees to that game. We had two extremely large marching bands on the field. Yeah. And together, together, together yeah. right, playing together, and it was a game of true, I, and I sadly could not be there. I had another function I was committed to that night, but I was getting reports all through the night. Miss Moore was there. I got... I got um, videos the next morning. There was so much excitement, so much positive energy, so much positive feedback. I, you know, the, the magic sauce that you started, Dr. Jenkins, and it, it is really spreading, and it is quite wonderful. So thank you. Um, it, the feedback's just been incredible. And of course, we have our groundbreaking next week. I don't know how to get it on the camera. I don't know where a camera is, but uh, we'll have them put it you up. You see all six um, of those back see there. See all six of them there. <laughs> I would imagine it's one of those. <laughs> we have we have our groundbreaking next week for the West Orange Relief High School. The festivities start at 4 p.m. Um, we have then a reception that has been uh, sponsored by community members and partners and put together by the West Orange PTA parents uh, at the West Orange Country Club. And then we will be doing our 60% design meeting for the new relief school. So we start at four, reception at five, and the community meeting is at six, and that will also take place at uh, the West Orange Country Club. So um, I know most of the board members are gonna make it, except for a couple that have to go represent someplace else on our behalf, and that uh, we are looking forward to um, breaking ground on this school and moving forward. It is, I'm sorry, it's October 24th, again, beginning at 4 p.m., and that is on um, the, the at, I'm sorry, what did I say? I said October, I meant September. September 24th, yes, no, next week, not a month from now, September 24th, and the Google address that is the closest is 5505 Winter Garden, Vineland Road, for those that need to Google the address, if you haven't been there yet. I think mostly everybody in this room has had to drive past that school now, but I, I look forward to having and seeing you all there. Mrs. Robinson. I wanted to ask Dr. Jenkins, okay, first start, Pam and Joey, y'all are still live. We all, this oh. is, we're all gonna have to get used to the new red button. We're I can't like, turn my, I oh, can't turn my stuck. button on when it's time for my number. So I'm being very, very quiet. Oh. And because my button doesn't, doesn't work, work with oh, my no. arthritic finger. Oh, okay, okay. So um, I'm being very quiet. Okay, you are, you are. Okay, I want to ask Dr. Jenkins, the new student information system that you're talking about that will help streamline and, and align a lot of things. When do we anticipate that? Do we have an estimated time of arrival for that? I believe. Yeah, you get do, it turned you on. do have to press it hard. Mm -hmm. it, better with time. I believe we're more than a year off before we okay. go live. So it won't be this year. But next school year, possibly? Possibly. Because the other thing you add into the crisis of Ed Moto and all these things is, like this weekend, my son had to get homework, and it was on Progress Book, which was down. So it's like, ah, you know, the little scramble. It says, we'll be live Monday morning. So you're waking up at 5 a.m. Monday morning to get your 
your vocab list so you can of course he waited till the last minute it's, ah. but but no. the point is he had all weekend he could have done it but progress book went up so anyway so yeah that would that'll be nice when it's we, all we will keep you posted on that i will tell you we're being very diligent because one thing that would be worse than the current student information system is to go live before, before ready with ready. a new one so right. we'll keep you posted on perfect that. thank you miss cadle I knew I would have trouble getting my button on, so I was prepared because the last time I could not get the button on and move the book over and everything. Um, tagging on, this was a long time ago in the conversation, but I am really curious if it is noodle soup for our totally digital schools. So when we start talking about all of this stuff, because the schools, a couple of the schools that were referred to, I happen to know, they are either bring your own device or something, because they are not totally digital. And so um, we don't have that many totally digital schools. And so does it look different if you are really digital from what it looks like when you're bringing your own device or everyone's trying to do their own thing. So for me to make a judgment on whether or not it's working, I need to know if it looks different in those digital pilot schools versus when you're trying to do it yourself without us having gone in and put the whole systems in. So, um, cause I, I know for a fact that both Winter Park High School and Glen Ridge are not totally digital. I only have two schools, and they're East River and Corner Lake, so they're way far away from where Winter Park High School is, and they will not be on. It's my understanding Winter Park will be on next year. So what does it look like if you are one of the digital pilot schools versus trying to do it midstream? Dr. Jenkins? It does look different for those schools that are totally digital. It would not be different for parent access if they are trying to look at progress book. That would not be different. But for the student environment, it is different for those schools that are totally digital. Mrs. Gordon. I, I know if it has like a, a little magic something right. Nancy is excellent with this. Okay. I'm bring myself up. Right. I, I would like to say thank you to Dr. Jenkins and especially her board service staff under the leadership of Deborah McGill. I really want to thank her staff for helping me to put on the ninth annual birthday celebration. School Board District 5 celebrated 146 years out at the Rose and Shingle Creek on Saturday. It was a fabulous gala. There were over 225 people that showed up. 50 additional people came in and out that were not invited. And I'm saying not invited because <laughs> We it was we, we paid I paid for everybody. So this did not come out of the budget. This was my thanks to the members of School Board District Five for working with us during the year. Every year we are celebrating a hundred and forty five, a hundred and forty six, a hundred and forty seven, hundred and forty eight, forty nine, and finally we'll do the fifty with the big finale. So we were together um, Dr. Lawson was out there with me. Um, oh my gosh, um, Joey Cadle was out there with me. Uh, Dr. Bridget Williams, who else, if you were with me, Linda Colbert was out there with us. I, and I know the other board members cannot come, but it was totally District 5. Usually we take the members that are 65 and older and take them out there. This is our ninth year doing it. And I think Dr. Lawson has been with me because he was like area superintendent. Um, I cannot thank you enough for being there. Even the superintendent had other engagements and she came. But I think the highlight of it all is um, the mayor of Orlando, the mayor of Edgewood, 
Um, the different mayors that reside in District 5 sent resolutions um, for School Board District 5. Uh, the former mayor, Ernest Page, was there, but the highlight on the cake was uh, Congresswoman Corrine Brown walking in, climaxing it, talking about education and what they are doing in, um, in Washington. But the sheriff was there, Jerry Demings was there, uh, the former chief of police, Val Demings was there, Reginald represented Buddy Dyer very well, and um, members of the Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Corporation was there, and they, Mr. Rosen was entertaining the national um, the directorate of the, these are the big, we said the big dogs and Alpha Kappa Alpha on a national level, they were holding their national meeting there, which we did not know because they don't usually tell us that they are holding their meetings so people won't just barge in. But they end up coming into our meeting. And then the Gamma Phi Delta supported us. And I wanted you to know, we decided this year, I never take um, any of the gifts uh, you know, like I think Dr. Bridget Williams, all of the area superintendents generally have the kids, you know, to send a T-shirt and beautiful designs. And we collected historical things last year for Debbie Pedraza and made um, Dylan Thomas group made, you know, like putting it together in a slide video. But you would not believe uh, we got with Rick Collins. Rick Collins right now, we're trying to count up the money. I'm not counting it. It's just all somewhere I got to find where everything is because it's all over the place. People gave money. Kim, in the graphic design, designed a poster. And in the board service department, under the leadership of Deborah McGill, they came up with the box and, and envelopes uh, designed by the graphic department, and people gave contributions to their schools. You should have seen how much money was just coming in for the schools in District 5. Um, it was amazing. All of the checks were written to school board District 5 or either written to that particular school. So I really want to thank you all for that great uh, weekend. On uh, Next year, we will do it again. We will be celebrating. School Board District 5 will be celebrating the third year of celebration. We will be celebrating 147 years. But we had State Representative Bruce Antone. We had Reverend Bracey. Um, I, I just can't begin to tell you. Reverend Pender was there. I mean, you name it, and everybody was there. My family came in from Indianapolis. They flew in from Atlanta. They came in from Charleston. Uh, it, 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 my daughter and all, it was just, it was a lot of fun to be there. And there was no electric slide, and there was no bid whist. There was no bridge, there was no checker. It was just everybody reminiscing about what happened at the schools in, in uh, School Board District 5 and in Orange County. So Dr. Jenkins, we thank you for that effort. We will do it again next year. And I know it will be even bigger and better, but it was over 250 people there, but we paid for 250. Yeah. So I think some just walked in, but. We paid for them, and it did not come out of school budget. It was my wedding, since I didn't get married again, it was my wedding money. Okay. <laughs> I would like to suggest that next year on your birthday celebration, yes. you look to see what day the Parent Academy is. No. Because I thought you, you lost. You know what? I, let me tell you about that with Dr. Shula. Let me tell you about that. They know, Joey, I'm angry. You should not have brought that back up. I'm very competitive. I thought that that's the only way you all won because they did it deliberately. She knows that I have never missed a parent. You shouldn't have brought that back up. Mrs. Cato, what she are you knows. doing? I have never lost a parent academy and deliberately put it on my birthday. And I've been celebrating my birthday ever since the Shingle Creek have been built. And for you all to cheat like you did so, is just Joey, unbelievable. Let me remind you that we are televising this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, Mrs. Robinson. Oh, no, I didn't have 
and oh, you know. say congratulations uh, to the winners. Okay. <laughs> I'll say it next year. All right. Got the competitive juices going. Uh, work sessions, we've got um, charter applications coming up on Thursday, guys. It's going to be a long one. We're bringing in dinner. We'll take a break for dinner. Uh, we think we can get through all of them in one meeting uh, Thursday. So you're going to be here late. Uh, plan on it. Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt again. Yes. I will be leaving um, to head out to the Christmas Civic Association meeting at 5.30. Okay. So I will be here for the first one, but then I've got a community issue out there I need to deal with. Okay. Thank you for letting me know. Um, we're going to try to start promptly at 4 o'clock so we can try to get done by 9 o'clock if at all possible. Uh, then we've got school start times coming up, the data there um, that we've asked, that I had asked for. And then we've got um, the ESC report update and our district accreditation review. And then we have some policies coming up. And then we have the ELL program evaluation report update coming up. And then we have uh, rezoning K-8 schools coming up on the 20th um, of October. And I think that may, may we'll see, be, be a long one. So. We've got a busy calendar. We're going to get scheduled that public school siding work session before the joint meeting. And board members, uh, we've been trying to find a slot, but I'm going to circle back with Ms. McGill and tell her we really do need to do a recognition meeting. A number of y'all have brought it up, uh, and, and it's been a long time since we did one, so we'll try to get one on the calendar. Um, anything else as far as meetings that we need? OK. Um, the salt, you're probably wondering, it's a little just token of our groundbreaking salt for a new home. So, um, so if you're wondering why you have a shaker of salt up here, that's why. And with that, we are adjourned. Yeah, exactly. <laughs>